The hour is six o'clock, so let us call our board meeting tonight to order um, for the purposes of our record keeper um, and recording secretary. It's Monday, June 12, 6 p.m. Um, and uh, we will uh, undertake three uh, hearings, license hearings for retail marijuana licenses uh, through the course of the evening. Before we begin, um, let me invite everyone present to please rise and join us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, um, so as I mentioned, we're going to conduct three different hearings uh, on the hour, hopefully, this evening. Um, and uh, this will be a process that takes us a few evenings, uh, tonight, tomorrow, at least one night next week, and then we'll see where we go from there. Um, before I dive into he any hearings, uh, Mr. Mackey has a comment or statement to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, fellow members of the board and members of our community. As we begin to review applications for adult use retail marijuana, an initiative that started to support our local economy and help fill vacant storefronts, I wish to uh, address my role in the process. In order to uphold the highest standards of integrity and public trust and to prevent any perceived conflicts, I have decided to recuse myself from the decision-making process on these applications. Thank you, best of luck in the process, and have a great night. Thank you, sir. All right, um, before we begin, um, just to potentially save um, a little bit of time administratively, I'm assuming there are representatives from Sundays in the room. Is there anyone from Lazy River here? Okay, thank you and welcome. And how about Full Harvest Moons? Is there someone here from there? Okay, it's a little early yet. All right, I'm just gonna try to avoid repeating myself a few times, but um, I'll work with that. Um, all right, these are formal public hearings, and what I do want to explain, I know uh, those of you who are applicants probably appreciate this, and some of my commentary will be for residents of the town um, and those who are either in the room or watching, um, either now or will watch a recording um, of these hearings this evening. Um, and that is first and foremost that this is the first time we're doing this. Um, as uh, many know, uh, Tewksbury as a community uh, authorized through the town meeting process um, rezoning to allow for uh, retail marijuana sales. Um, and we are afforded under the state law and construction of um, the number of licenses to award up to three licenses uh, in the course of this process. Um, it is a percentage or the number is determined by a percentage of the uh, all alcohol liquor licenses that we have in the town. Um, so the number is guided by state law. Um, the process ultimately that we follow here at the local level um, will then proceed forward. Um, any approvals that we make will go to the Cannabis Control Commission. And similar to liquor licenses where uh, the local body here, the board, select board, approves license applications, um, and then they go forward to the ABCC for review and approval, um, the process will unfold in likely a similar matter, a manner, excuse me. Um, so our goal tonight is to learn. Um, this board is not um, in the business tonight of um, opinionating, um, or, um, you know, politicizing any issues. Um, our hope is the discussion, I know from the applicants uh, won't be, but for the benefit of residents, this isn't a time or place to discuss should we or shouldn't we have retail marijuana sales in Tewksbury, that was decided. Um, so the issue here is about the qualifications um, and the background um, of each of the applicants. So this board along the way can consider um, among a large group of applicants who uh, the board feels is appropriate to award any one of those three or up to those three licenses too. Um, so 
It may be a little clunky, because this is the first time we've followed this process. We're going to learn. Um, we might learn together. Um, and what I'm going to ask each of you to do, and I'm going to speak, uh, and I'll read the hearing notice shortly, but I'm going to say this in general so everyone has an outline, and then I'll repeat it later on this evening for those who aren't present. But our intention, our ask, um, is that um, each of the applicants give us 15 minutes, no more than 20. Um, tell us what we need to know. We've all had the benefit of these materials. Um, and I know my colleagues sitting at the table have done their homework and they've read them. Um, and they've done some research on their own. So I ask you not to necessarily make a sales pitch, but tell us what you think is the key criteria for us to be aware of. That's what I'm hopeful we can get to. You're all business people, and you're all in some ways being uh, assessed here on your ability to run a business here in Tewksbury in a, a unique environment. Um, so part of that criteria I would advance to you is efficiency and to the point, candor, as opposed to um, a lot of bluster, right? So um, we have to get through a lot of these, so I'm asking for your cooperation in that regard. That doesn't mean to cut corners or not say something that you feel is important, but please be to the point, okay? Um, I'm gonna then follow that presentation by each of you um, with a series of questions from board members. They may or may not have questions. That's fine, you may have answered them. Someone might on my left, for example, might ask a question that was on someone to my right or so my list. It's gonna get crossed off the list. We don't need to ask the question again. Um, but my hope is that we, as a board here, um, can limit that to, again, very direct, specific questions that are of importance to the individual select board members. I wanna emphasize that we're only fact-finding tonight. We're taking information in. We will be listeners. We're not really in the game of engaging. We might ask questions, but this isn't a debate. It's tell us what we need to know. Um, and I think my colleagues will certainly agree, we're not here to express you know, a preconceived outcome or an opinion about this one's better than that one or we like these two. That's not gonna happen tonight, all right? We have another set of hearings for three applicants tomorrow and we have another night next week. Um, and this process will continue probably for a little bit beyond that as well. So I just want to manage everyone's expectations. After we get through select board member questions, um, I absolutely, because it is a public hearing, we'll open it up for any public comment. If we have residents here or abutters here who wish to express any concerns or observations or opinions about um, the particular application that we're taking the hearing on, we'll entertain that. Um, but I'm gonna ask that people limit their comments to three minutes per person. And again, be to the point, don't be repetitive. Um, if someone else has said the point that you intend to make, um, there's no harm in being brief. But again, we, we don't need to um, be repetitive or overly repetitive. Um, and as I said a minute ago, we're gonna focus on the application and the locations and the qualifications. We're not gonna relitigate tonight whether um, retail marijuana sales is appropriate or not in our community. That, this is not the forum for that. So I say a lot of that for the benefit of any residents who might be here or who will walk in, and I'll probably repeat that a few more times in the next week or so. Um, so just understand that it doesn't begin and end tonight. This is a process we're gonna follow. Um, it's an important part of the process because we're gonna start to hear from you. I know most of the applicants um, have at least been in front of the planning board uh, on a preliminary basis. In some cases, um, you've already been through and have um, you know, an approval, which is helpful, um, but we're, we've got a little ways to go here. And our deliberations will take place down the road. Right? Again, this is gonna be fact-finding tonight, okay? 
So I'm going to dive into the first hearing. Um, I'll invite the applicants to come forward and uh, take a seat. Um, and I will read the hearing notice. That notice is hereby given that the select board will conduct a public hearing in accordance with select board regulation, Article 37, Marijuana Retail Sales License Policies and Regulations on June 12, 2023 at 6 p.m. at Town Hall located at 1009 Main Street in Tewksbury, Massachusetts, 01876 on the application of Canifords Inc doing business at Sundays for a license to operate as a marijuana retailer on premises located at 2504 Main Street, Tewksbury, Massachusetts, consisting of an area of approximately 4,050 square foot building. And as always, we put on our hearing notices that inputs welcome from the public. We do recommend that comments be submitted in writing to the select board before um, last week, Thursday, June 8th. Um, and I will also note for the record that um, there is a, um, a butters list, um, one page butters list um, of abutters to the property that all were notified by the applicant. And we have a copy of the legal notice that was posted um, dated May 24, 2023 for this particular hearing. So with that having been said, um, let me ask uh, you two gentlemen if you can give me your name and uh, affiliation or address for the record. Sure. I'm attorney Blake Mensing, 100 State Street, uh, Boston, Massachusetts. Thank representing you, I'm Brad Tosto. I'm the owner, um, and I live at 50 Cardigan Road, Tewksbury, Mass, okay. 01876. Thank you both. All right. So I'm going to turn it over to you. And Great. You hopefully got my message. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Right. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm attorney Blake Mensing. I always find it a little bit helpful to, to give you a brief background on who I am. Uh, I'm actually a former municipal attorney, um, so I've uh, you know helped folks in your very seats as well as having been a conservation commissioner. So I'm uh, sensitive to all the demands placed on you and certainly aware that cannabis is not the only thing you think about. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, however, the only thing I think about. Um, since adult use legalization came about, um, I used that background uh, as well as I have an advanced law degree in environmental law, which is basically just administrative law, just different regulatory subject matter. Um, so with that, I have exclusively focused on cannabis businesses the past five years. Uh, I've helped get over 100 licenses in the state. Um, so I'm frankly nerdily excited that you have questions because I love to answer them. And I, this is all I think about and all I have dedicated myself to over the past five years. Um, so with that, we're going to uh, go through a brief PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I'll confess at the outset that I am not the biggest PowerPoint guy, so I may gloss over some things. You certainly have the materials. Um, but yeah, my main goal is exactly as you outlined, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, you know, define the team give you the background, describe the location, some of the operational, um, you know, bells and whistles, and uh, address your, your fundamental question, you know, what's the most important thing to think about when you're deciding who's, who's the winner here? So I'll, I'll touch on that. Um, so yeah, just by way of introduction, you just met Brad. Uh, the other owners are Peter Wilson and Stephen Doherty. Doherty um, uh, my understanding is that Stephen's uh, quite quite a long time Tewksbury resident, uh, as is Brad, um, and uh, Peter, while not a, a native, he, he is uh, bringing some skills to the table that I think were, are readily adaptable. Um, he is a, a dentist, um, and there are certainly uh, a myriad set of rules and regulations you have to uh, comply with to run, uh, you know, run a dental practice. Um, so with that, that's some of the backgrounds. Uh, for those of you who don't know uh, Steve Doherty, um, he's been in, in town for years. Um, he's the founder of Iron Diamond Works. Um, and uh, Brad also has a skill set I think is fantastic here. Uh, one I confess to not having myself, but he's a CPA. So one of the main obligations of a cannabis retail is detailed record keeping. Um, and that is you know, done in a universe of spreadsheets. Um, that stems from uh, the seed to sale tracking platform, which every retailer must uh, abide by. And that is a trail of digital breadcrumbs um, represented by a physical tag on each product to understand who grew it, who manufactured it, and ultimately who sold it at retail. Uh, and that's certainly used uh, and usable to figure out how it ended up, where it ended up. Uh, certainly the goal is to sell it to adult consumers and have that be the transaction. Uh, certainly not naive to the fact that sometimes kids get into places in your know, parents' homes they shouldn't. Uh, with the seed to sale tracking, there's a way to find out from, from whence it came and then ban the person who you know, made the purchase. So with that, we can go to the next slide. So yeah, uh, just 
regulatory compliance is you know the floor, right? It's it's the minimum you have to abide by to function in this industry. I constantly tell my clients, you know, if you don't play by the rules, you can't play the game. So uh, there are a couple hundred pages worth of regulations at the state level um, that sit on top uh, in addition to what Tuxbury requires uh, for an operator. Um, so I think you know the background of being a CPA and a dentist uh, gives you some some you know chops to navigate this. Uh, and then certainly uh, at the risk of patting myself at the back, at my back, uh, you know I'm around to serve as, as outside general counsel to clients where they say, you know the regulations say this. Um, you know, lawyers write and speak the way we do, so you have to hire another one of us to figure out what we're talking about. So what I do is I translate and say, here's how you meet that standard, um, whether it be something as simple as, you know, what imagery can I put on my packaging, um, to, you know, how quickly do you have to report uh, an incident if something happens on site? The answer is 24 hours. Uh, so yeah, I think that aptitude um, is, is the crucial thing to focus on. Do I trust that they can follow the rules? Do I, do I trust that they A, want to, and, and B, can they do it? Um, I think you know this. This background is pretty ideally situated to, to follow the rules. Uh, and again, if you don't follow them, the commission is going to be more than happy to drop the hammer on you. Certainly, there's uh, local enforcement mechanisms. Uh, with retail, um, I think the sort of chief concern is likely uh, one of traffic. Um, the reality is we have uh, almost 300 stores that are open today across the Commonwealth. So the early you know, reports of thousands of people in line, everyone wishes that would be the case. It's not going to happen. There's just too many places available. Uh, and my opinion is people are likely only to drive back maybe 20 minutes to find a cannabis store. So uh, there's you know, a geographic opportunity in addition to the licensing opportunity here. Uh, you've got some stores around, but it's not like one in every corner. Um, and obviously, you're limited to three in town. So yeah, my clients, as, as some may recall in the room, uh, were some of the first people, or the first people, to broach the topic of adult use cannabis in town. Um, so they've uh, undertaken a few sort of efforts um, in, in parallel to the tracks that the town you know, created in terms of uh, you know, say hurdles to, to clear. Um, so one of those is uh, my client did appear before the planning board and did receive the approvals. Um, I, you know, in this very room, uh, you know, gave, gave an outline of um, sort of the physical parameters and some of the operational flow, which I'm happy to get into some of those questions uh, a little down the road. Um, so yeah, the timeline is, is relatively self-explanatory um, up, up on the slide here. Um, my clients have been chomping at the bit to say, hello, is this legal in town? And once it became legal, uh, they actually elected to hold a second community outreach meeting, um, both as a, a listening session and to say, you know, hi, we're, we're putting our, you know, our, ourselves out there. We would like to do this. Um, so obviously town meeting passed it, and uh, I, I will not address the question of should it or should it not be legal. It is. So uh, yeah, this, um, you know, being first in line certainly guarantees them nothing. I think all it does is show you, you know, initiative and eagerness. Um, to, to, you know, be judged on their merits. So the proposed location, yeah, 2504 Main Street. Um, in addition to being a cannabis attorney, I actually own a, a store of my own, so I'm, I can't claim to be an operational expert, but I'm certainly more involved than the average attorney. I, I have a store that's running out in Holyoke for the past two years. So this layout is really, really good. I'm actually quite jealous. Um, it'll have about 1,500 square feet of sales floor area on the first floor. It'll have about 1,200 square feet um, in the basement that's going to be primarily used as a vault. Um, so as the name implies, there's going to be some beefed up security in terms of the physical infrastructure. I'm certainly not going to go through every bell and whistle here lest I give a roadmap to criminals, but uh, suffice it to say, you're not getting in there um, without uh, lots of people knowing. Um, the commission requires 24-7, uh, you know, 365 video surveillance on every square inch except the bathroom for obvious privacy reasons. Um, these facilities are more buttoned up than a bank or a pharmacy. Um, and certainly, uh, from, from my standpoint, you know, they're selling things that are far less dangerous than you can buy at a liquor store. So uh, the second floor will be, uh, I think, another about 1,200 square feet. That will be administrative offices. Um, so the, the flexibility that the 1,200 square foot um, basement provides is the ability to have essentially a, a satellite vault on the sales floor. So the bulk of the products will be stored not accessible on a sales floor, and it's going to be periodically staffed by uh, only those members of the entity with the su sufficient you know, hierarchical rank to access the vault, right? You're not giving the keys to the vault to your day one employee, or you shouldn't. <laughs> um, 
And, and the other thing that I think is important to note here is that this is a currently vacant property. Um, it's not doing anyone good sitting there, you know, rotting. Um, so uh, it, it generally takes, you know, a, several hundred thousand dollars to bring these facilities into compliance with the security regulations. Um, there's obviously some aesthetic beautification that will take place just to make it, um, you know, presentable. Not to say Sal's Pizza wasn't, but it's, it's going to be, you know, polished. Um, the security regulations, again, uh, are going to uh, make it, you know, a near certainty that anyone who tried to, you know, commit a crime there is going to get caught. Um, that goes as granular as, you know, the, the, the uh, video resolution, they dictate what you must have. Uh, you have to have anti-loitering policies, all these things that um, really, I think, are, are meant to dispel the notion of, you know, grubby stoners. It's regular people who have jobs all sorts, you know, from all walks of life. Um, I think a lot of people in the cannabis sphere today, you know, treat it as an errand. Um, many stores will say, oh yeah, we've got this great consultative experience and I just sort of analogize it to a liquor store. Do you spend 20 minutes talking to your liquor store clerk? Probably occasionally, but not every time. So I think the model here is just, you know, best products you can, best prices, treat people the way you'd want to be treated, um, and, you know, hire as many local people as you can uh, to, to keep jobs and, you know, earnings in town. Um, the traffic study, uh, as sort of evidenced by the grant of the approval by the planning board, uh, indicates minimal impact. The <coughs> best example I like to use is that these stores are less busy than your average Dunkin' Donuts, uh, and no one is clamoring for Dunkin' Donuts is, you know, to be shut down. So um, that also is a factor, a factor of the fact that we have many more stores in the state. Um, so you know, not, it's not going to be 2018 traffic volumes there. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, this is uh, sort of hard to read, but um, basically it's going to be like a re you know any retail store you've been to, there'll be obvious point of sale systems. Um, there's going to be uh, mandatory security point checks uh, checkpoints before you get in to ensure that someone is the age of majority, which in, in this state is 21, uh, and uh, that ID gets checked both before you enter the facility and when you're making the transaction at the point of sale. Um, every receipt is sort of verified with the customer before they can walk out, uh, and every product is then put in a sealed exit bag um, that can be you know mylar or paper bags you know stapled together. So it's not evident what someone might have purchased as they leave. I think that's you know uh, a nod to sort of protection of personal privacy. Um, you don't want someone, uh, pr probably a criminal, to identify, hey, they've got a lot of products. Um, so yeah, there'll be you know the normal stuff you find in a retail store, a break room. Uh, I think that'll be housed on the second floor. Um, and as I mentioned, we'll have that satellite vault that we'll call the fulfillment room. Uh, that's where sort of products that are stocked on the shelves will get uh, sort of uh, re-upped during the day as needed. Uh, at night, it all gets moved down to the vault locked up and, uh, you know, security monitoring galore. Uh, so with that. So yeah, um, just back to the question, you know, the fundamental question you asked, what, what's the key criteria that you should be considering here? Um, it, in my opinion, it's, it's, as I said earlier, it's, it's about aptitude. Um, no one in this state has a 20 year cannabis resume, right? The oldest resume is five years old. Um, you know, and I think, being a novice is not even necessarily a bad thing when you're navigating regulatory waters that aren't all the way defined. Um, they are, uh, you know, tweaked as commissioners come and go. Uh, we have, you know, five new commissioners compared to the five that started, uh, and they have very different opinions on certain regulatory matters. Um, so it's every licensee's obligation to know those rules and, and follow them. Uh, ignorance of the law is never an excuse. It's doubly not an excuse in cannabis. Uh, and certainly what a lot of clients say to me is, but other people are doing it. That's toddler logic. The rule is the rule and you follow the rule whether the, you know, the commission is enforcing against that particular violator uh, you know, or not. Um, so I hammer that home uh, and you know, I think a lot of people have a lot of opinions on attorneys. I, I represent people that I believe can do the right thing. Um, I, I take this industry really seriously. Um, it's, I honestly feel lucky that I get to practice cannabis law. I didn't know it would be a thing ever. I just sort of went to law school and enjoyed cannabis privately, and then it became a thing, and I said, wow, I can marry some passions together and, and help people follow rules. Um, so yeah, I think aptitude is important. I think um, you know, people with a commitment to the town, um, you've got two people with you know, multi-generational backgrounds in, in Tewksbury. Um, not to say you can't be from anywhere and be successful, but I, I would personally factor that in if, if someone were appearing before me. Um, and then, you know, again, the bare minimum. Can they follow these rules? Do I think they are, you know, A, smart enough to figure it out, uh, and, and B, honest enough to do it the right way? Um, a cut corner in cannabis might save you a little bit of time, 
but this is you know, a, a privilege, not a right. And frankly, from my perspective, the commission is all too happy to pull the rug out from someone if they don't follow the rules. Um, you know, it's, it's crucial. So um, with that, I'm not exactly sure of the time, but I think I've covered pretty much everything in our presentation and I uh, relish the chance to answer all of your questions. All right. all right, thank you for that. And I appreciate your um, concise approach to it. So let me open it up to uh, my colleagues um, and see if they have questions they want to ask. I'll ask uh, Mr. Holland, why don't you lead uh, us off? You have great experience in management and being a dentist, a business owner. What experience do you have with marijuana? Yeah, so what I alluded to earlier, the fact that no one has a super long resume, um, they, they don't have legal experience with cannabis because it's, it's relatively new. Um, the reason I personally don't think that's, that should be a non-starter uh, is, is just as I said, the universe of people with a lot of experience is relatively small. Um, in, in my store, we have a general manager who didn't know a thing about cannabis and still, frankly, doesn't know a whole lot. Um, running a business and complying with your regulatory obligations are two related, you know, balls of wax. But I think the skill set required to run a, an efficient business is sort of, uh, you know, it's a it's a deeper pool of people who might be able to run the store versus the people who would serve as the wholesale manager. Uh, and the reality is that the wholesale market is you're limited to what the what products are sold in state. So, you know, I think you can look to what other stores are selling in terms of product mix. Um, you know, there's a million different delivery types. You know, everyone's seen, you know, the flower, the, the bag of plant, but there's, you know, salves, palms, topicals, suppositories, gummies, chocolates, you know, vaporizers. So I think learning, um, you know, what products resonate with the clientele is a, a sort of a learning curve that's naturally going to happen regardless if you have experience. Um, and again, I just look to the ability to follow the rules. Um, and, and yeah, I'll let uh, Brad weigh in if he wants to give an indication why he thinks he can. Yeah, no, I, I do think it's a new industry and I, you know, it wasn't allowed in town, you know, where I've been a resident and, you know, I always wanted to be a town, uh, sorry, a business owner in town. Um, and I think being a CPA, you know, you have the financial records. I'm, I'm the head of tax at an investment management company, you know, billion dollar publicly traded company. So I think I can apply with rules. The control environment's really at the top, you know, of the business organization. So having that skill set helps resonate down to, you know, right. your general manager. So the tone is really set by us who knows the rules, who follows it and has that, that experience of right. tracking. And, and, and just yeah, to piggyback on that, the, the, the culture of how you run a business does start from the top. So it's really hard to tell, you know, a 22 year old kid paying, you know, 20 bucks an hour, hey, it's really important that you follow these rules. They, there's mandatory trainings, um, both, you know, in house and there's something called the responsible vendor training program that every retailer has to go through. As the name implies, they're trying to teach you to sell responsibly in terms of not, you know, offending a daily purchase limit or anything like that, or not selling to someone who's, who's you know, visibly intoxicated. Mm -hmm. um, so. You know, the reality is for, for the retail side, it's the same crowd of people who work retail, you know, I think across, across the country, right? Um, I, I've worked it myself, you know, people have stops in retail in their, in their lives and, you know, working for, I, I had a job at Sam Goody. Did I care about their inventory counts the same way the owner did? No, but I did as best as I could. And I think that was because my manager was frankly an extremely serious person. So I think setting the tone, setting the culture, um, you know, everyone has to have written standard operating procedures to say, here's how we follow the rules. It's not a static document. You can't just put it in a drawer and forget about it. You, you, you train them and say, here's how you follow the rules specifically. Uh, and I think, you know, their background and aptitude make them, you know, able teachers. So hopefully I've answered that question. Yeah, the next question I have is one where, is there anybody, I mean, you're saying you're training. If you have no experience and you're gonna train the people, how, what about potencies? And I'm new to this. I don't know sure. anything about it. Yeah. You know? uh, sure. Potencies and so you know, what's strong, what's not strong. Yep. So the Cannabis Control Commission regulations on the adult use side, um, uh, especially with edibles, really, really limit the maximum dose allowed. Um, so what's allowed per sort of serving size for an adult use edible is 5.5 milligrams per serving, up to a total of 110 per package. So just pic picture, you know, a chocolate bar with 20 nibs, and each one is is a unit. Um, so that 
partially you learn from the product manufacturer. Um, partially, you just know what that edible dosage means uh, on the adult use side. Um, for someone who consumes cannabis regularly, 5.5 milligrams is going to be a, a whisper of a feeling. It's not going to really get one, anyone where they're trying to go. Um, I think they regulated that way to avoid people you know, having too much and freaking out. So the problem with edibles, uh, and I say that as someone who doesn't frankly love them, is how it hits an individual depends on, you know, the person's body, what they ate that day, um, you know, the, the source of the cannabis. So, you know, you can have cannabis distillate, you can have uh, any number of other sort of infusible uh, oils that go into the product. So I think the first, you know, gatekeeper is who made it. So the, the people who work retail figure out, you know, hey, what do we do? Um, some of them, some of the like seltzers have, um, you know, ex explicit instructions on the packaging. Say, start with one. Um, what happens with people eating edibles is they'll have it, you know, half an hour later, I don't feel a thing, so they double up. And then it kicks in another half an hour later, and they're going on a ride they're not expecting. Um, what I would say if I happen to be a retail you know, salesperson is um, time is your friend. If you ever have too much cannabis, just wait. Um, it cannot biologically kill you. Um, if you can chew on some peppercorns, that'll bring you down really quickly. If you have a lot of CBD, that can also bring you down. Um, so yeah, I think education starts with you know aptitude and the inclination to learn. Um, and I think the, the collective brain power of the team is such that they can figure it out. Um, there's certainly you know unanswered questions that come from the federal prohibition. Uh, they say, you're naughty for touching or, or thinking about cannabis, so you can't study it. And then they say, well, we can't legalize it because you don't have studies on it. Well, you said I couldn't do it. Well, how, how can I get you the information that would serve here? So I think the whole country is in flux about what this looks like. Um, I just personally think back to you know, the before time when it wasn't legal. And it was part of everyone's life, whether you used it or not, right? It's been around for all of human history. So I think learning um, you know, on your own uh, is, is the first start, uh, starting point, and then you know, figuring out from manufacturers What's the intended, you know, on-ramp time for this product? Um, you know, there's fast-acting gummies. You'd obviously tell a person, hey, the label is correct. It's going to be faster, you know, hitting than if, if you have, you know, an unlabeled product that's, you know, using a, a sort of run-of-the-mill wholesale distillate. Um, so, yeah, Read, reading is my answer to that question. <laughs> reading well, about it. You answered the question, he did. <laughs> well, I am that's employed. All, I'm, all set. <laughs> I'm on call. Now. Okay, anybody else? Yep. Ms. Wellman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about your finances and your capitalization so that we have an understanding that you are financially solvent enough to do the, you know, the polishing yep. of the building, the landscape plan, those kinds of things? I'll just make one point before I turn it over to Brad. Uh, technically speaking, under the Cannabis Control Commissions, there is no financial uh, minimum. Uh, unlike medical, where you had to have a half a million in liquid funds to then pay the $50,000 application fee. Mm. Uh, I have gotten people licensed with $0, um, but I think your question's great because you certainly can't open with $0, so I'll turn it over to Brad. Yeah, and so I guess just a little more clarity on, on what you're asking. Are you asking about the total capitalization of the company? Are mm -hmm. you? Yeah, so we're, we're capitalized with you know over $750,000 um, ready to be used for it. And then we do also have access to other capital needs if, if it's required. Um, Steve, uh, the other co-owner, um, you know, he owns Iron Diamond Works. It's a $40 million a year um, thing, and he's financially capable of um, bringing a cannabis. Is it just the three of you that yeah, are capitalizing it, so you don't have a lender or No, any, no, okay. it's just the three of us. And no other no, investment there's company? No, yeah, no need okay. for it. Okay. And I would just note that uh, 750 is, is, you know, it's not going to be the Taj Mahal of a retail store, but it's absolutely going to hit every bell and whistle in terms of security requirements and obviously sort of minimum aesthetic, uh, you know, standards that they have to make it presentable. Um, you know, one of the, one of the bigger expenses is the security install. Mm -hmm. um, that'll probably be in the neighborhood of seventy-five, eighty-five thousand in a facility of that size, if I had to guess. Um, and then the rest is you know fixtures and um, you know that sort of thing. So yeah. should be plenty of money. Um, Talk to me a little bit about why this location is your preferred location. It's not near a highway exit. Um, you know, it's near, I'm not going to say exactly adjacent to, but residential areas. So can you talk to me about why you feel this is a good location? Yeah, I think it's a great location because it's located on Main Street, you know, up in North Tuxbury, you know, we're really close to Lowell or Haverhill or where all the stores are already. Mm -hmm. So that market, you know, it's already pretty saturated up there from a new stand. So 
we figure down on the south side of town where it's not as uh, many stores. The town's neighboring don't have as many stores. We think it's a great opportunity. Also, it's been vacant for the last five years. I mean, growing up here, I loved going to sales after baseball games, but um, yeah, it's just been vacant and that really creates a disinvestment in the community. I mean, you look around and you know, it just it looks empty. So when we were talking with the town, you know, they said that they wanted to, you know, they would like to refit, you know, these vacant buildings. So we went out and purchased one. Okay. So. Um, thank you for that. In section eight of your business plan, you wrote a lot about volunteerism in the community outreach section. So I'd like for you to talk to me. I was hoping your other investors would be here to talk to me about how you currently volunteer in the community. So uh, currently I do a lot of volunteer work. Um, with my company, um, you know, with the auditors, they always have the community outreach, uh, well, not community outreach, but, you know, Cradles to Crayons is one of the events. And so just uh, and the Mass CPA, uh, not Mass CPA, MS CPA for the dogs. Yep. Love the dogs, but that's kind of more how I volunteer. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so I'm the other investor. Uh, Dr. Peter Wilson. Um, so I do a lot of volunteering as well, a lot more of the dental field. Uh, we do give a kid a smile day at least once a year at my office up in New Hampshire. Uh, children come in, we basically do free dentistry for them, for the kind of the underserved community. Um, give out toothbrushes, things along that, that line. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, my final question is, do you have any specific relationships with suppliers at this time? With suppliers? Mm -hmm. No. There's no, basically budget. they won't talk to you until you have your final license. Um, otherwise they, they think of you as sort of a tire kicker. Um, but you know, as I mentioned, I, I have helped get over 100 licenses um, and I did deep ethical research to figure out, can I make introductions between clients? And the answer is absolutely yes. So I introduce folks all the time and don't ask for anything other than, you know, say thank you. <laughs> Got it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Anything over here, Mark? Yeah, um, just quickly, um, you answered a lot of the questions that um, the other uh, select board members answered. But uh, <clears throat> one of the reasons that, um, you know, this was a place where we had a restaurant and on Route 38, a pizza joint is pretty much gold um, because of the location of what goes on. Uh, this place had difficulty because of the driveway, getting in and out, uh, working with the other businesses. It was tough to can stay in business and uh, they did well for a while, but it just was not an easy place to get in and out of. Having one access, is that, that's gonna remain the same from what I understand? Yeah, during the planning board process, um, there was a traffic study that, that found that this will not have significant, significant adverse impacts. Um, with respect to parking, my understanding is that Steve has uh, either purchased or is about to purchase a building next door um, that will have some satellite parking. I think what would happen is they'd ask the staff to park, uh, you know, slightly off-site, but again, directly next door. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't think the sort of curb cuts will change, um, but yeah, uh, as I said, it's, it's not gonna be, it'll be less busy than a Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah, the business next door, is that in the plaza or be the, behind the plaza? It, it's one of the office um, in the plaza. Okay. Um, one of the other concerns, I, well, uh, it, questions that I have is that uh, um, the security for this. I know you showed a security plan. Do you have a security officer working in the place at all times? So the commission uh, requires certain staff to, have, to basically function with security in mind. Um, basically everyone gets trained on what to do, uh, you know, if you need to press the duress alarm. Um, there is no requirement that uh, any sort of third party security uh, provider be on site. Um, there's actually a, a really good reason why uh, none of these facilities in Massachusetts, to my knowledge, have any armed guards, and that is because under federal law, the penalties, uh, the criminal penalties, penalties associated with violating the Controlled Substances Act go crazily up if there's guns involved. Um, I'm only aware of two instances of attempted uh, burglary in the whole state. One was during uh, a riot in the city of Boston. Someone threw a brick through a window. They you know, smashed and grabbed a few things, but they all got caught. Uh, and then the other one was up in Rowley. Some people with their proudly displayed New Hampshire license plates pulled directly up to the cameras, broke in, got caught the same night because they're on camera. Uh, 
Um, so yeah, the, the training um, for each individual employee uh, is a function of the responsible vendor training and the security protocols that aren't, you know, basically pictures of where the cameras are. Um, but I will let Brad or Peter answer if, there's, if you have a plan to hire a separate security system. Uh, uh, security. No, no, we're, we're going to be using a third party you know, to set up our security and monitor the video cameras, but we were not planning to have a third party security team. Well, one of the reasons I brought that to question is that there's a couple of banks up in that area and the banks were robbed. Okay. Even though they're federal banks and even though there's there's high th things against that, they were robbed numerous times in the last like five years. Somebody went in, you know, it may have been some sort of dependency issue or whatever it is, but they, they didn't care. Uh, thinking that this place may be something that deals a lot with cash transactions or other things like how is that money like yep. there's not a lot of money in stuff like each cashier or whatever counter person does the money go immediately down to the vaults or no, I don't want to make this seem like something that but there's a lot of cash available and this makes it a prime location to try to uh, yeah no no so you know there'll be set limits on what cash draws can happen and there'll be a process to you know count the money bring it you know, bring it to the vault to count, to count, it'll be in camera and then it'll be stored in the cash vault until we use yep. um, the proper transportation methods to bring the cash to the bank or transport it. And just a couple quick points. Uh, it, cash is uh, a big, bigger portion of, of sales at this kind of facility than, you know, your CVS, but it's about a 50 fix, 50 mix. Um, there are, um, uh, pin debit solutions that uh, I'm not a banking attorney, but apparently don't offend federal law um, where you can use it basically as a quasi ATM. Um, so, you know, it's your, your returned change on cash. You didn't actually hand the, the company. Um, so that's one mechanism. And then the state does require cash handling uh, contracts with uh, basically an armored vehicle provider. Um, they require you to randomize the pickup times. So, you know, if someone were casing the joint, the truck would come at a different time, you know, on different days of the week and that sort of thing. Um, and yeah, again, I, I would just point to the absence of headlines across the state where these t these places are being targeted. Um, I, you know, I think criminals, obviously, they come to crime in all different sort of ways, but I think they've sort of gotten hip to the fact that this is not a great target. Um, I had a client in Arizona with a medical facility. He got a letter from the sheriff saying, thanks for putting your dispensary on you know, the wrong side of the tracks. The criminals in the area know that as a no crime zone um, because one thing I advise clients to do is, hey, if you can share your footage either sort of on an ongoing basis or as needed or even live with local law enforcement, why, why wouldn't you help them? Um, so yeah, I, I don't think these facilities are you know, the sort of attractive beacon of crime that many fear. Um, and yeah, I, I would just say if, if anyone's foolish enough to try to rob one of these places, they're going to get caught. And I think the training to the staff is just give it, you know, give them the product, give them the cash. It's insured. It's not worth dying over, that kind of thing. I just have one last question. Um, this was a former restaurant. It's been closed for a number of years. Uh, has somebody inspected the building? Um, I mean, you're talking 750000 which sounds like a lot. But once you get into construction costs, then you've got to clean something out. And if there's grease and other things and other things that have been used in that building. I'm guessing a lot of it may need to be gutted out to remove some of the walls and other things that may need and putting a, a, a vault in a basement is not cheap. So, so that's that's uh, seems like a I can I can touch on the last part of that. So vault is just the regulatory term of art. It doesn't mean, you know, physically a three foot thick steel, you know, door kind of thing. Um, basically, the standard is one of, of delay. So, um, you know, without giving away the whole game, but um, you can put things between the flashing and the studs to make, some, make you know, if it's just drywall, someone can kick through it. Um, I've seen clients of mine use, you know, aluminum flashing, chicken wire, anything where you, you can't get through that wall without, they call it, uh, without the aid of mechanical means. So saws, blow torches, that kind of thing. Um, and really it's just to, to get them caught in the act. Um, if someone wants to get into to the vault in a cannabis store, they can. Um, it's just going to take them a lot longer than they think, and that's when the police will have time to show up. Okay, and what about the uh, yeah. the build out upstairs? Has it been inspected, the building, or to see what the condition of it is? Yeah, we, it, it's not in, you know, I'm not the construction guy here, but uh, yeah, no, it's been inspected, and, you know, the 750000 we we do have access to additional funds if needed, so, um, yeah. 
but I think the, the most of the dollars will be put towards beautifying the 1,500 square feet or, or so of you know floor accessible sales sales area. Um, you know the offices I don't think have to be a, a monument to architectural design or anything like that. It's got to be clean and, and you know habitable. But I, I think they'll probably spend more of their dollars on making it a you know clean, comfortable space to enter into as a customer. Um, you know I picture the vault in the basement as probably you know what you'd picture you know a basement that you probably want to get out of as quickly as possible. Yeah, that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Richard, could I ask you to do me a favor? Could you just close those two doors? Thank you. Richard, do you have all right, any um, just a couple of questions from me, and many of them you've touched on already. So um, I'm going to narrow this down. But we spoke a little bit about traffic. Um, but what I'd like to ask you to do is quantify that maybe more in like customer expectation. Do you, can you can you give us estimates on um, like daily customer, weekly customer counts that you're anticipating? Uh, my first thought is to certainly share the traffic study if you have that. I don't have that number off the top of my head. Um, we, yeah. we we have it and we've reviewed okay. it. And so. I, I, this isn't a perfect one-for-one one analogy, yeah. but um, my store is in, in Holyoke. Uh, it's about 2,000 square feet total. Um, we see between, I'd say, 275 to maybe 400 people a day. Okay. Um, and again, that's a function of how many stores have opened. Um, yeah. So we're actually open uh, from 8 to 11. So that's, it's you know pretty, actually, surprisingly, a lot of people come first thing in the morning. <laughs> which I don't really understand, but, uh, and then, you know, logic would dictate that right after working hours close, that's when we see the next bump, and that's certainly when we do. Um, so, you know, a 1,500 square foot store, um, what are you gonna have, probably 10 point of sales? So I think you'll probably average, you know, four minutes or so per customer. Um, yeah, so we, we were ballparking in around the same amount of, you know, in a non-peak day, right, around 200 to, 230 and then more in the busier days, upwards of you know 450 to 500 in you know, on peak days. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. And Thursdays, for whatever reason, are, are a big day that sometimes Payday. outpaces Friday. <laughs> yeah, that's probably you it. You want to do your chores before the week. <laughs> that's probably <laughs> it. Okay. All right. Um, just a kind of speed round question, but um, anyone on your uh, team here involved with any other application before us? No. Yeah. This is it. Okay. Um, and then if you're not approved, um, will you or would you be involved with any other application? Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. And then the last one I think kind of speaks for itself, but I just want to get it on the record for a residence. Um, you, you were kind enough and we required it, but um, a template host agreement. Um, if you're one of the license applicants to be awarded a license, uh, I assume you're willing to meet with management and the board to modify the agreement in yes, some way. Of course, right? yes. Okay. All right. Those are my questions. All right. So I want to thank you for trying to answer those as quickly as you can and as directly as you can. I, I think that's been helpful for our board. Um, let me turn to people in the audience. Um, I, I don't know if there's anyone here who wants to speak to this particular application. Residents? You do, ma'am? All right. So just come to the podium if you don't mind. And if you don't mind, start with your name and address. Just pull that down a little closer. There you go. Sure. Thank you. Um, my name is Dale Atlas, and I own the office at 2500 Main Street, number 208. Yeah. And so that's the property adjacent. And so, of course, our concerns are mainly with the traffic and the impact of our building, because we're very small private offices. Um, counselors and chiropractors and, and accountants and so forth. And we have, as you've mentioned, the um, common entrance to the parking lot mm -hmm. and, you know, how the impact, even as I'm hearing the, um, the customer counts, that's really high for what our small office building sees every day. Um, and so I'm wondering on your slide, you mentioned that the location has sufficient parking for customers and, and employees. And I'm wondering, is there a specific requirement, parking space requirement for a building of that size? Yeah, so um, let me try to answer that. And, um, I, and by no means are we going to be experts in this. But there, there has been, number one, a traffic study, which deals with the ingress and egress, right, of the facility. 
Um, and that's online to my recollection. Um, Mr. Montori can confirm that. So you can, so you can review that. Is that um, an independent study, do you know? It, like, it or was, is that a study done that's by? That's correct, yep. It's an yep. independent study, yep. okay. And then um, as it relates to um, the, the number of parking spaces that is uh, regulatory controlled and the planning board through the site planning has input into that by my recollection. So we don't speak to that here, but the planning board did. Okay, um, so I'm just wondering if, I mean, maybe you have that information. Does your parking lot, um, is that sufficient to cover what's required for um, yeah. your customers and so, employees? So just let me um, slow it down for one second because I don't want to get into a back and forth yet. Sure. You're asking the question through me and I'll okay, ask sure. counsel to, Sorry. to uh, try to address it sure. um, as best we can. Right. Uh, so I will confess to not remembering the precise ratio. Um, typically zoning bylaws have a ratio of either building square footprint to parking spaces required or employees per uh, parking space. Um, I genuinely don't remember what it was, but I remember you know, being in this room and saying, here's the metric and here's how many spaces we have uh, you know, for, to satisfy that ratio. Um, and then in addition, I just reiterate the, the statement that um, one of the funders, uh, founders of this has uh, purchased a unit in the office building next door and it comes, I guess- In, with, our, in our units? Yes. Okay. So there's, that's I think where employees are gonna be encouraged to park. I don't think you'd notice the difference between an employee who parks there versus any employee of any of the other businesses. They're gonna park and go to work, you know, like the rest of you all. Okay. okay. All right, so the traffic studies online. Mm -hmm. um, you can certainly follow up with um, the uh, planning department on the parking requirement, um, but the planning board in its site plan review process addressed those types of concerns. Okay. Okay. Um, sure. <coughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know if I'm, I'm asking through you. I, um, I understand it's like that there was a request to lease additional parking spaces. Is that an old thing since the, the unit was purchased? Um, I don't know, Council, can you yeah. speak to that? I think it was purchased recently just yeah. to have as a, a backup so you weren't relying on all of the parking spaces. Um, basically, they didn't want to split it between employees and customers. Okay. Okay, okay. thank you very much. Thank you. All right, anybody else? Okay. Well, we Believe thank you for not, your time. I think we did okay. Excellent. All right. And I did just want to confirm one thing. Yes. Uh, you, you said this was this, and the subsequent meetings will all be fact gathering, i.e., no vote till later. Okay. That's correct. Well, then so I won't ask what you. I'm going to ask my colleagues to do now um, is um, to continue this sure. specific hearing, um, and I'm going to ask them to do that to uh, a date specific of July 18, which is our July meeting. Okay. And the intention that we have is um, as we talk to the other applicants, that may trigger additional requests that we wanna make of you. Um, some uh, thoughtfulness about your presentation tonight, the PowerPoint, um, and we may have some additional questions. Great. So I wanna leave the opportunity open. We're gonna um, very deliberately put um, this hearing and others on for July 18. Um, and that will be um, our next opportunity to either follow up with you, ask some additional questions, or we'll take the opportunity to close the hearing at that point. Sounds okay. good, thank you. So um, I need the cooperation of my colleagues to do just that, so I'm gonna ask if one of them would offer that motion. Sure, Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to continue the hearing until July 18, 2023. Thank second. You. All right, so we have a motion made by Ms. Wellman and a second by Mr. Holland. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? And I will vote in the affirmative as well. So we'll, um, we'll do our homework. We may reach out to you, counselor, sure. uh, to your client, through you. And um, I want to thank you for um, the approach you brought to the table and uh, the information that you shared with us. Thank okay. you for your time. Thank we you appreciate so it. Thank you. Best of luck. Thank you. I'll close it. All right, we're going to have to um, take a brief recess until 7 o'clock, and then we'll start our next hearing. <clears throat>
all set? Thank you. All right, so we're back um, and we're gonna do our seven o'clock hearing. Um, let me read the hearing notice at the outset that uh, notice is hereby given uh, that the select board will conduct a public hearing in accordance with select board regulation article 37, marijuana retail sales license policies and regulations on June 12, 2023 at 7 p.m. at Town Hall 1009 Main Street, Tewksbury, Mass. 01876 on the application of Lazy River Products, LLC, doing business as Lazy River Products for a license to operate as a marijuana retailer on premises located at 553 Main Street, Unit 2, Tewksbury, Massachusetts, consisting of an area of approximately 8,700 square foot building. And again, inputs welcome from the public. We recommended that uh, comments be submitted to the board um, by Thursday, June 8. I'll note that there is a, an abutters list of those parties notified. It uh, looks like about 52 um, in uh, residents or uh, ad addresses, I should say, um, that were included. And the board is in receipt of um, the legal notice that was filed dated May 24, 2023. Um, so um, I think you all were here when I started my earlier <coughs> comments. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna save the repetition. Um, hopefully you understand what we're trying to accomplish and I'll certainly um, step in and, and guide you if I need to, but I'm sure um, you're gonna help us to understand what we need to know here. So would you do us a favor? Um, just introduce yourselves for the record so we can capture that detail. Certainly. I'm attorney George Malonis. I'm here on behalf of Lazy River. Uh, I will tell you that I am not a cannabis expert. I assisted the Lazy River with their permitting operations in Dracut. But as I think you'll find out after, after our presentation that uh, with me is William Casotas. He's the CFO of the operation. Okay. Uh, also with me is Mark Leal. He's the uh, C, uh, chief operating officer of the operation. And Kevin Platt, who is the horticultural director of the facility. Uh, all three of these are both the owners uh, and, prime, and investors of the operation. Okay. Uh, they, they operate and they permitted, began operations of a facility in Drake in Massachusetts. It's a 40,000 square foot grow and retail facility. Yeah. Uh, and they've had great success there. Uh, also with me tonight is uh, Steven Sapinski. Uh, with Andrew Consultants. He was the engineer who had appeared before the planning board. And he's here tonight basically to answer questions that any of the board may have concerning the project and, and the, the site, although it yeah, is an existing site. Right? All right. <laughs> a little overkill okay. maybe, but we want to make sure we have all the information available. Thank you. Um, I had planned on talking a bit further, but based on comments before, I think we want to get right to sure. the presentation. I think you'll find that Mr. Kosotis and his staff are very well experienced, very experienced, knowledgeable in the industry, and have demonstrated a proven track record. Yeah. I think the other uh, factor that should come out of the hearing is that they are probably the only integrated applicant. In other words, they, they both uh, supply the product and have experience in retailing the product. And, uh, and it's in an adjacent community. Um, in, in Drake, it was their prime, where their primary operation is, uh, and these guys you'll hear are all local. Uh, they're uh, from Londonderry, New Hampshire. They've known each other for years and have been in the industry uh, in some cases, in this case, the case of Mr. Platt, for over 25 years in the legal uh, right. cannabis industry. So great experience, and I'll let uh, William get to it. Thank you very much. All right. Great. So great to meet all of you. Um, Thank you. My name is William Casotis, I'm the CEO of the company. And we're just going to walk through a couple of slides here. Um, I hate first, to be rude, but I'm going to turn side. Please, it's quite all right. All right. Please, uh, there's some good stuff up here. So first, we just want to identify where the location was for everybody that was watching at home or uh, attending at the meeting. We are at 553 Main Street, Unit 2 in Tewksbury, Mass. This location is more commonly referred to as the, uh, the, the Ocean State Job Lots Plaza. Um, there's, a, there's an expired Crunch Fitness in there as well. So if you guys are familiar with that plaza, that's where this location is. Um, this um, unit two is the parcel that um, abuts Papaginos to the right-hand side. So it sits right in between Papaginos and Ocean State job lots. And that's the 8,700 8, square feet that, uh, um, that we're talking about developing here, okay? Um, as far as who we are as a company, I think that's important to know who you're dealing with. Um, the organization was formed back in 2018. We're not new to this game. Um, so we've been here since the very onset of legal cannabis, adult use cannabis here in Massachusetts. Um, we formed our company almost immediately after um, 
um, we found out that Drake, it was as soon as the laws were passed and we knew that Drake, it was um, uh, going to become a yes community. And once they basically announced who was going to be uh, on the yes side and who was going to be on the no side as far as communities. And once we found Drake it, um, and started those conversations, we got right to work. Um, as um, uh, Attorney Malonis mentioned earlier, um, as far as uh, we know, we are the only fully integrated uh, provider uh, in that we are not just growing cannabis, we um, also have a full laboratory um, with guys in white coats that are operating very expensive pieces of equipment, um, and we are extracting um, uh, THC oil um, and other cannabinoids from the actual organic plant through extraction, you CO2 extraction, but we, we are actually running a full lab and are just added to that lab by, um, by building out a whole new section of it for solventless um, extraction, which is a, opens up a whole new realm of products for us to develop. But I think all in all, the, the important thing to take out of this is that we are in fact a product development company. We're not just a retailer. We are constantly innovating and producing new products. So we do grow cannabis, but then we take that cannabis and we run it through our lab and extract it and produce high quality oils that we can then use to fuel a number of different programs, including um, non-consumable concentrates, um, but also we take that same distillate, um, make it, it, it goes into an edible sort of form and then um, feeds a whole line of products that comes out of our kitchen. Um, so we have all of those business units running, including a wholesale aspect of our business, um, as well as a retail. So in the one building, we have three licenses, which makes us fully integrated to include a, a cultivation license, mm -hmm. a product manufacturing license, which covers the lab and the kitchen, and a retailing license, which allows us to retail it. Um, we are also, though, as just mentioned, wholesaling the products that we develop to a number of other retailers throughout the state of Massachusetts, and that list of customers is ever growing. So that's, um, that's sort of that. Um, as far as headquarters, we are based in Drake, Massachusetts. Um, when we first got into this, um, we had uh, an incredible opportunity um, to move forward quickly. Um, we didn't have the need to bring in any outside capital um, for a number of reasons, which we can talk about certainly later. Um, but at the time, um, I was transitioning out of a business and looking to get into a new business. Um, and um, Kevin, with his experience, and Mark, with his experience, um, Kevin was working in Maine at the time, it just opened up the door to us possibly doing something together. Um, together, the three of us have been involved in cannabis for a very long time, um, uh, although it is not something that we've all done professionally together. Um, but now we are able to get into business legally with each other, and it's a great opportunity. Um, so um, we're doing that in about 40,000 square feet. As Attorney Malonis mentioned earlier, we built a ground-up facility. We literally bought a 20-acre um, a parcel right in downtown Drake, it, very expensive, invested heavily. Um, it's a campus environment. We have three buildings on the property. Um, some of them have mixed-use tenants in them. Others, uh, other buildings are used for our office spaces. And then one building out back, which is a dry warehouse, um, we tore down and literally constructed a two-story, brand spanking new 40,000 square foot, state-of-the-art um, facility um, at the cost of about um, $16 million. So we invested heavily um, in Drake it. Um, again, there's about four business units running out of that one facility. We employ about 75 people right now, but we are going to be closer to the 100 mark in about another 12 months, just with the onset of all of our growth. Um, so let's just move on to the next slide here. That's just, I mean, again, just wanted to give you some background of our, our exposure in the business. We've been in it for a long time, and um, I think it's important to understand that. Um, I think another big important point here um, is... Um, just the amount of charitable giving that we do. We're going to dive into that a little bit more in some later slides, but I just want to just briefly just touch on our mission statement so you get a really solid understanding of what our focus is and who we are as an organization. Um, and we wrote this ourselves. We didn't have chat GPT do this for us. We didn't have, uh, we didn't call somebody up and pay them, you know, $20,000 to, to write up a mission statement for us. We did this ourselves, okay? So at Lazy River Products, it is our mission to be recognized as the Commonwealth's premier fully integrated cannabis-based product development company. Our goal is to consistently deliver trusted small batch craft quality products and exceptional service to our customers and the local communities for which we serve. At our core, we provide professional, compliant, and socially responsible standards that raise the bar and will be the new definition for excellence in the cannabis industry here in Massachusetts. We will always diligently work within each of the local communities we touch to help facilitate strategies to further enhance economic opportunity, build strong neighborhoods, and provide a solid framework for quality growth and development. Give back, grow, succeed. You'll find that on all of our packaging. You'll find that everywhere. You'll find it on our t-shirts. 
Give back, grow, succeed is the company's motto. It is what we live by. It is a part of our culture, and I think it's very important for the town to understand that. Okay, I'm just gonna give you a quick shot of the actual project. Um, just so you can understand the size and scope of this building, it is massive, okay? Um, and we wanted to give you a shot inside some of the areas. Um, you know, we have a functioning retail facility, okay? So, and what's great about that is that we can show you exactly what this facility is gonna look like in, in Tewksbury because it's gonna look very much like what you're seeing right here. Mm -hmm. We have a branded concept, okay? Um, and that's another big thing that's different about us. You know, we, we, we have a plan, you know, and our plan is to be a branded, uh, a strong brand, not just a company that's selling products. Um, so the branding is a big part of what we do. Um, our retail, um, although we were incorporated in, in 2018, um, it took us some time to build a 40,000 square foot facility, design it, plan all of the intricate pieces that went into this, um, and bring in all the expert that, experts that was needed to actually frame out each of these individual business units and then put it all together for us. So we got that open in 2020. It took us a couple of years to work through building and licensing um, because it was very all early on at that point too, and it took forever to get through the CCC licensing process. But in 2020, March of 2020, we opened the doors. Um, that business unit um, employs about 35 um, FTEs, which will be very similar to what we'll have um, in Dre uh, I'm sorry, here in Tewksbury, okay? Um, the positions will include positions like managers, assistant managers, a number of team leads, as well as a number of customer service representatives. The one position we did leave off here, and it was mentioned earlier, we will have a security person here. We have an office for them already designed into the facility, just never made the list here. Okay, so there will be somebody that will sit during normal business hours um, in a room monitoring stuff and also helping with just uh, deliveries outside, et cetera. Is that your employee? They will be our employee. We don't employ anybody from the outside really for anything. Thanks. Um, so we run the facility um, in Drake it from uh, 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. Monday through uh, Saturday and Sunday we run from 9 to 6. Um, this location does about $14 million a year in revenue. I'm not just referring to the actual retail component, none of the other aspects of the business just what we're actually selling for product through the retail dispensary. Um, all of our modeling um, that we did, and we gave you a very high level view of financials in our packet, yeah. um, we, but obviously um, we can go into a lot more detail. And the numbers that we gave you were incredibly conservative. They will not align with the number that I just gave you here, um, but that's because we like to be conservative when we present. But the reality is that we modeled everything that we're gonna do in Tewksbury off of Drakeit. They are almost identical markets. They are very similar. They're within a very close proximity of each other. There's a lot of very close similarities as far as where these locations are with respect to each other um, in town. Um, and so we have a very good indication of what we're going to be expecting here for traffic. So we can, be just based off of what we've already done in two and a half years of doing business, almost close to three years now, um, we can tell you what we're going to do in this location for revenue. Okay, so um, we're going to be, it's going to be closer to that $14 million a year mark. And that's to start, you know, to get rolling out of the gates for year one. Um, two experience numbers were modeled off of Drake, it just is, and we just touched on that, but we just said that we... One correction, that's my fat finger. We actually opened March of 2021. Oh, thank you, Mark. Yeah, sorry about that. Oh, man, I thought we were... <laughs> that's, that's, right, say, that's right in the middle. It's a rough <laughs> month to open. Sorry about that. It actually that. worked out that we were out. <laughs> 2020 was a tough year. That was a bad month in 2020. Yeah, yeah. yeah for sure. Thanks yeah. for the correction. All right, so cultivation shortly uh, opened shortly after our retail in 2021. This is a shot of one of our active um, flower rooms. This is one of eight flower rooms mm -hmm. that we have in our facility. Um, so we produce a tremendous amount of cannabis um, and a lot of that is being uh, fed through our own retail store currently. It'll also be used to be feeding our supply of products in Tewksbury. That's another great thing. You know, I heard you ask an, uh, one of the earlier applicants, what are your plans for supply? And the question with others, the question, uh, the answer for us is we control our own supply chain from end to end, yeah. which is beautiful. We also do business with a number of highly valued brands in Massachusetts. We have a lot of strong partnerships um, that are already established in, in place in Drakeit. We will carry those over here as well. Um, but we produce a lot of our own products and most of the products that people seek out from us are the ones that we manufacture ourselves because they are of such quality. Uh, and getting back to our mission statement, small batch, craft quality cannabis. That is the difference between us and anybody else who may be growing product that is applying, uh, is that we produce quality cannabis. It's, uh, and there's, it's not an easy thing to do. Okay, 
So the lab is another business unit that we have, right? So this is our actual CO2 extractor. This is one of many pieces of equipment that we have. We have Pope stills, we have roto vaps, we have decarb ovens, we have stuff all over the place. Never mind what we just um, rolled in, um, which was a six-figure investment um, for our solventless lab. Um, which is, again, going to open up a whole new door of new products for us to be selling into these new markets. Um, but we are running CO2 extraction and solventless in this lab. Um, we extract THC from the raw material um, through a specific process using these this pieces of equipment. And again, those, that distillate, um, which is the end product, is used to feed a number of different programs in both our kitchen and on uh, the lab side for both uh, like standard concentrate products, things like um, cultivar-specific vapes, full spectrum vape products, botanical vape products, infused products. We have an entire rosin program now, thanks to this new um, hash rosin lab, so it's very exciting. The kitchen is a whole nother aspect of things. Um, we're currently producing about eight SKUs um, for our gummy program. So we do have a full gummy program. These are very high quality products, guys. They're not like stuff that you're just gonna find on most people's menus. We, we um, are very sophisticated in the, in, in the sense that we employ very good talent. Okay, and those people are able to do really cool things like reintroduce cannabinoids into the products. So we're not just putting THC into these products, we're able to put things like CBN and CBG. We're also able to take that standard gummy that most people would eat and it would take 55 minutes for them to hit them. And we have brand new food technology that's available to very few people. It's called hydrophilic food technology and it allows us to take that medicine Okay, and encapsulate it in a water molecule that's a thousand times smaller than a nanoparticle. So when you eat our gummies, if you're eating one of our fast acting versions, as it's breaking down in your mouth, you're gonna feel that in five to 15 minutes as opposed to everybody else's standard experience, which is a 45, it could be 40, it could be half an hour, it could be 45 minutes, it's a crapshoot. You never know when it's gonna hit you if you're eating a standard onset edible because it has to pass through your liver. Whereas this is just breaking down and being assimilated right into your bloodstream. So I'm just trying to give you guys some indication of the level of sophistication that's going on over in the lab. It's very high tech stuff, but we are producing eight SKUs on the uh, gummy side. We're producing eight SKUs on the chocolate side. We just rolled out four SKUs for a brand new line of tinctures. And we are now in the pet business. So we are actually doing CBD um, products for pets. And it's, it's crazy to think that there's a market for that, but it is amazing how big it is. Um, so we're producing products for them now. Um, we will also, by the way, be producing other CBD products in the future. So we will not just be a cannabis shop. The goal for us is to bring all of the CBD business into our dispensary as well. And why is that important? Because the CBD that you're um, residents are, that are currently buying this stuff off of store shelves in convenience stores and other places, that CBD is not tested and regulated. There's no third party independent testing results on that stuff, so nobody is really able to indicate exactly what they're ingesting when they're buying the stuff. And every single product that we produce is tested by a third party independent laboratory, and we post those results. Um, we talked about the wholesale program. This is actually one of our billboards on Route 93. Um, if you've ever been up and down Route 93, we have a static billboard there and a number of electronics running there. Um, but this is just to sort of advertise um, our wholesale program. The program is a success. We've only started it um, in mid-summer 2022. And today we've got about 50 wholesale clients that we're selling into regularly, and that is ever growing, okay, as people are realizing the quality of these products. Um, I think it's important for you guys to understand a little bit more about the executive management team. You want to know who you're doing business with, right? So let's talk about this. Each of us, um, the people on the executive management team, and when I say that, I'm really referring to myself, the CEO, William, Mark, the COO, and Kevin, who's the CCO of the company. He's the chief cultivation officer of the company as well. We, we recently shook some things up and, and, and made some changes on the infrastructure. So those, I know there was some confusion earlier on, but I just wanted to touch on that. These are executive officers in the company um, and have proven themselves over years of doing business with the company. Um, all three of us are locally born and raised guys. Um, we grew up in this area. I say in this area um, because it was Southern New Hampshire, but we've all got family in and around these areas, okay? Uh, we all grew up here. So um, we've been uh, entrenched in areas like Tewksbury, Lowell, Lawrence, uh, Methuen. We, we've all got family around here. Um, so um, um, the three of us, I think it's also um, important to know, have had long-standing rela relationships. We've known each other for 35 plus years. The three of us went to middle school together and have come up together all through the Londonderry school systems. We all went off to start our you know, college careers, our professional careers, um, and then came back together to do this um, after we put our time in. Um, and now it's time to have some fun and build something exciting. So um, 
I think one other important part, point in that, in talking about that, is that we're the three people that make all the decisions in the company. You're gonna find, especially with companies of this size and magnitude, and I, we don't even consider ourselves really a big operator. We're really small in the sense of things. There are 100,000 square foot operations out there that have 100,000 square feet of canopy, okay, that are in 135 or 140,000 square feet of space that are growing cannabis. So we're, we're, we're on a bit of a different level. But with companies like that, they have to spend a tremendous amount of money to get those facilities built, open and operated and working and functioning and get all their programs in place. And oftentimes it's very hard to do with private funding. So they, they, or what I should say, is through a single source, through single source money. So they're, they're out there oftentimes bringing in partners and doing the things that they need to to raise capital. None of that happened here. We control everything from end to end. Every new product we create, it's the three of us sitting down talking about, it's a team of people obviously involved in this process too, but we're the ones making all the decisions for the company. There's nobody governing us, telling us, hey, we want you to move that product out to sale regardless of quality because we've got sales, uh, we've got um, um, board members that we've got to um, appease. Okay, there's, there's none of that kind of stuff happening. We control the quality. We control every decision in the company. And that's very unique in this business. Um, I myself, I'm a seasoned business owner and operator. I'm a, I, I spent 17 years building my own business prior to getting into this business. I had 20 brick and mortar locations with approximately 300 uh, employees. Um, I sold the PE back in 2018, which is allowing us to do what we have started here today. It's awesome, it's, it's a great thing. Um, I myself five years now in Massachusetts cannabis and three years running Lazy River Products, and I'm a founding member of the company. Mark is sitting next to me, um, and again, you're seeing this this live shot here, but <laughs> it's just because of the slide. Um, but Mark is a seasoned executive manager, 20 plus years in corporate America, managing large teams, responsible for launching new international markets and managing that growth. So that was with a, a whole separate industry, but Mark has been able to take all of that knowledge over here with him. Um, he's now also got five years in Massachusetts cannabis experience, three years running operations at Lazy River Product. And when I say operations, I mean all four business units report up to Mark, okay? All four business units. So that's a lot. With KPIs and all the things, that's everything everybody has to manage, mm -hmm. that, that's, a lot, that's a lot to do. So, um, and then we've got Kevin, who's sitting directly behind me. He didn't want to sit up front. <laughs> um, Kevin has been in the legal, legal cannabis business for 25 years. How is that possible? Well, Kevin got started. When we were off going off to, 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 uh, to college, Kevin went out to California, and um, he was pursuing other things out there. Um, and at that time, um, back in the mid to late 90s, they passed some brand new legislation called Proposition 215, which was the first of all medicinal legislation in legal cannabis anywhere in the country. Okay, um, and Kevin was out there for that and was uh, able to plug himself in at a very early stage um, and very early on in the process. And he's got some incredible stories of working with the original guys who really got legal cannabis off the ground. Um, but also Kevin's experience in getting into this business was that he was growing cannabis for his landlord who was dying of HIV. Mm -hmm. And that, that was his, ex his, his exposure into this was from the medicinal angle. Um, so it's exciting for us to, to, to also explore those possibilities. We do exciting things down at our facility, like run a Med, a med Monday, a Medical Monday, give people, giving, even though we're adult use, giving people an opportunity to come in and um, buy products that we develop ourselves without having to basically assume the tax, which is the real benefit of being a medicinal patient in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. is that you don't have to pay the taxes on those products. You also get access to different levels of medication on the edible side, but everything else is the same. So a lot of those people that use flour and concentrates and things like that, or topicals or RSO oils, they can come in and buy that stuff from us on Mondays and get a discount for that. But that's whole, that's, so there is that, that side of things too in what we do, although we are not medically licensed today. Okay? That was gonna be a question. Um, this is the company's org chart. It, I hope it's visible uh, from end to end. It seems somewhat thin in certain areas, but obviously this is gonna change. But I mean, this just shows you um, what's going on um, at the back office level, okay? There's myself, there's uh, Mark, there's uh, Kevin, we have a director of finance and we have an entire HR, we have an HR person right now who's in the process of building HR team, okay? Um, but there are a number of other things that feed underneath um, what goes into running these places. So, um, for instance, we have production managers. We have not just, a, you know, there's of course the structure for retail, retail, GM, all those things, but every other business unit is its own company. So. 
imagine that. So there's, there's, there's heads of each of those departments, okay, and then uh, subsequent staff members that fall underneath all of those people, okay. Um, when we bring on Tewksbury, um, we're anticipating, as we got to earlier, 34 FTEs. It's really more like 35, 36 FTEs for Tewksbury, considering the, the uh, security aspect, um, consisting of uh, managers, assistant managers, 14 leads, 28 CSRs, and we forgot to put in those those security people, but they will be in there as well. Um, in preparation for the, additional, uh, for the addition of Tewksbury, we're also gonna have to make some changes in the back office, okay? We're gonna have to add some more people, okay? So for us, this isn't a small undertaking, um, and there's gonna be a lot that goes into what we do to get this, um, this new location off the ground successfully, and that takes manpower and smart people. So we're gonna be bringing on a new marketing director, likely, to help us run the uh, marketing uh, department, which is already established and doing incredibly well. We have great people in there. Um, we we're just looking for a little more structure and to be able to organize things at a higher level. We have um, going to be adding in some HR resources as well as some finance resources just to offset some of the workload that's going to be coming in. And all of the people that we're going to be um, hiring um, locally here are, of course, going to there's going to be a local hiring preference. If we can, every single applicant that applied, if they were from Tewksbury, we would make a best effort to hire all of them. Okay, um, it's really going to be more of a matter of expertise and are we getting enough quality client, you know, applicants, and if so, sure. we're going to work to place them. Okay, um, this is a shot of the actual plan. I know that this is shot in planning, um, and we've already been through the planning board process, and we have uh, already received our site plan approval. What I wanted to do is just show the board the building. One, um, I wanted to show them the amount of available parking. Number two. Three, I also wanted to just articulate that there is lighted traffic light out onto Main Street, okay? The reason we bought, uh, not bought, but the reason we um, locked up this location as early as we did, the board may not know this, but we've been paying dark rent on this space for well over a year now. And before you guys even enacted your legislation, um, why did we do that? Because we knew it was the perfect location. We knew that there wasn't a single reason why the CCC could shoot this thing down. And the goal for us, when we do receive our approval, hopefully, um, with your blessing, um, the goal is to be the first to open in town, and we're ready, you know. So we just wanted to touch on a few of those high points. Um, mm -hmm. This is the interior, okay, and this is very important. Um, first, I'll just say this. We just haven't slapped a couple of, you know, we didn't break out the ruler and just start drawing some things on a piece of paper. We have a full set of DD drawings done with our architect right now, and we're moving to a set of construction drawings. That's how far along we are. We already have our, um, our construction firm picked, They're the same firm that helped us build, two, I'm sorry, Drake it. They'll be building this location as well, and we already have the budget in mind. We already know exactly what this is gonna cost us, okay? You can see that if we were to go all the way to the back, that would be the full 8,700 square feet that we have available to us in this space. The grayed out areas in the back are the areas that we won't be building out because we don't need those areas. Um, but with this design, we are getting everything that we have in Drake it and more. Okay, and I'll explain. Um, actually, if I could, what I'd really like to do is turn this portion of it just over to Mark quickly so he can just walk us through the workflow because this is operations related. I think Mark should talk about this. And he's also got a great technical mind and works hand in hand with our um, security people in uh, not just establishing our security presence, but also managing it and all that goes into managing that on the back end. Um, so, that said. Oh, cool. There it is. I was just telling him we didn't bring a laser pointer, but there's one built in, so that works out nice. Um, so just to walk through the flow here, so we've got our front entry here, and this is this is modeled very closely to what we're doing in Drake It. The good news about having our Drake It retail open these last couple of years is we've been able to figure out what works and what doesn't work. So we're definitely not bringing anything that hasn't worked and that we've uh, rectified. We're not bringing that those mistakes here, that's for sure. Um, so we've got a separate entry and a separate exit at the main lobby. Um, as soon as you walk in here, this is our lobby area. We've got guest relations, which is also security check-in. Um, there's a restroom over here too. Of course, the um, customer will show their ID, and this is a locked door that gets buzzed once the uh, ID is verified. And then we've got our sales floor here. The entire sales floor, including this, uh, the point of sale counter, is about 2,000 square feet. As soon as we walk in here, we've got some display tables with some great technology. Um, we're working with a group, and we've got it. Um, we've got the technology in Drake it as well. Where any customer, we've we've found that you know you've got two different types of customers. Whether it's you're shopping for cannabis or anywhere, there are customers that want to walk in and 
they want to ask questions and they want to be helped by one of our customer service reps. You've got other people who just want to be self-sufficient. They go to a kiosk. They can learn on their own through the kiosk. They can submit an order through the kiosk. The order gets um, sent over to our um, fulfillment <coughs> station and they walk right up, show their ID one more time at the uh, point of sale, grab their product and, they, and then they leave. So this wall right here is technology that allows our customers to be, for those that do want to actually um, be self-sufficient, they'll be able to learn about any of our products, any of our vendor products as well, place orders and then they can do the checkout. And we've got display cases in the middle that um, accommodate some of that technology as well. And I think it's just important to touch on the fact, I don't mean to interrupt, ahead, just, just want to quickly focus on the fact that education is important. That's why we invest in these stations, because a lot of our customers, have, some of them are experienced and have that understanding, but a lot of, it would, it, is, it would be shocking if you were to ever come in and just hang out and drink it someday and see the different types of people that are walking in our door. A tremendous amount of them are people that have never consumed cannabis, and they're in off of a recommendation from their doctor to, to, to get a local cream or something like that to address some local pain. Okay, because the doctor doesn't want them taking more prescription drugs. So there, there's a tremendous focus on education here as well. And these lift and learn stations and these, these new pieces of technology help with a lot of that. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Absolutely. Um, and once, uh, once a customer is ready for checkout, they come right up over here. We've got, we've got stanchions and, and sectioned off lines, uh, an online order line. And then we also have the, uh, the guest walk-in um, checkout as well. And we've got 10 POS stations here. And typically what ends up happening to, to show you the back end of um, the workflow as well is we've got our fulfillment station with a pass-through window that's right here. And this is all of our fulfillment area. So when an order is placed, that order gets sent back just kind of like a, we, we, we um, compare it to a restaurant model. So the order goes, it's a pick ticket, goes straight back to our fulfillment team. They fulfill the order and they pass it through here. Customer service rep grabs it sends it out to the uh, customer checkout, customers on their way through a separate exit um, right through here. If I just continue on some of the other workflows that we have, we've got this, we're fortunate enough to have this large um, drive-in bay. Um, so when we receive orders, we're actually able to, um, to secure that area, intake the order, and then also process it here. And then we've got these secure storage areas, vault and fulfillment that are in these two areas here as well. Mark, Mark is making light of this, but that secure drive-in that he's showing you up front is incredibly unique to cannabis, okay? And it's gonna allow us to bring our delivery vans directly inside, close a door, and have true secure delivery. That, that's, that's, we don't even do that in Drake yet. We have fences and stuff, but it's, it's a best effort. This is true secure delivery, so that, that's unique. Sorry. No, that's perfect. Um, so these two areas are secure storage areas for vault and fulfillment. And then all of this back here is just back of, off, uh, back of house. So we've got a little conference area, um, some offices for our general manager, security, the IT room, that type of stuff. Um, break room, a um, bath, couple bathrooms back there as well. And then this grayed out area. Even though we could utilize it if we needed to, we just don't need to. Um, we have more space than we actually need in this footprint. Um, we've got plenty of storage opportunities. Um, that's the one thing we've found. I think no matter where you go, you buy a new house or you open up a cannabis facility, you run out of storage pretty quick. So we're not, that's not gonna happen here. Um, so we've got plenty of storage opportunities. Um, and uh, yeah, I think a great footprint. And if I can continue, we've got our security slides on the next um, the next slide here. It's shrunk a little bit here, but I think I can still walk through this workflow for you. This is the, what we're calling this here is our level one security. This is public area. You can walk in as long as you have an ID, but there's no secure access here. Um, but once you walk into the sales floor, that's what we're considering our restricted area. Um, you need an ID to get in there. This door is locked here. And then the uh, shaded pink area is the secured access only. It's a limited access availability. You have to be an employee. You have to have an access card and the privileges and access rights that were uh, awarded to you when you became an employee. That's what the red shaded area is. Um, there's also in this uh, depiction here, we've got about 35 um, security cameras um, in all the necessary places. We've got them out front. 
um, capturing anybody who's you're capturing video surveillance of anybody who's walking in, and then also the parking lot, which is extremely important. Uh, we've got ca uh, cameras in the guest relation area, and then of course in the sales floor um, above all the point of sale stations and then a couple um, overlooking the center of the sales floor and then of course one pointing towards the ATM and all the relevant places that we where we would require a camera and then of course in the back of office uh, or back of house the retail vault the fulfillment vault we're gonna have cameras over there as well um, and all the required locations uh, for what, what we've done in Drake it is um, all of our security surveillance is run on dual redundant servers so if one of them fails we always have that backup footage. Um, we would be doing exactly the same thing here as well. I think it's important to note that not everybody does that. <laughs> okay, it's a massive investment in, in additional infrastructure. Yeah, right. Uh, you never know if a power supply is gonna fail or who knows what, so we've, uh, we've taken those um, precautions. The other thing too is, um, I think I'll mention it here when we go into access control. You can see the same perimeter um, built out here for access control. Um, what we've done in Drake it is, you know, we have our operating hours, um, which of course the operating hours will be what they are here in Tewksbury, but we also have notifications um, that get sent to all of our phones, and including our security personnel, where if a door, a secure access door going to a vault um, is opened or attempts to be opened with key access for somebody who doesn't have that, uh, the authorization, we get a notification. So for us, we close at 10 p.m. Um, so anything, and then we get we allow 30 minutes for inventory counts and closing up shop and all that. But from 10:30 uh, 10:30 p.m. all the way up until 8:30 um, a.m., we get notifications if anything happens in that building that's not supposed to happen. So that's on top of you know the backup redundant servers and the security and the motion detection that we have enabled in our uh, uh, on our cameras and face recognition and all that kind of stuff. We've got sometimes you know. I don't really like to wake up with a ding at 2 a.m. 2 but if I'm waking up because I got a notification at 2 a.m., then there's something pretty serious that's going on. So fortunately, we've never had issues like that, um, but uh, it is a notable thing for sure, and I, I figured we'd make sure we mentioned that to you. We'd be doing exactly the same thing here. I think that's another important point too. Yeah. Yeah, the important point is just the fact that we haven't had any issues in Drake. It we, we've got a clean track record. We've been running and operating that business for three, close to three years now without any issue. Yeah, and we're at the last couple of slides, so I'm going to give this yep. back to William. We'll just make this real quick. I you know, break down. Yeah, thank you very much. So we just wanted to quickly just speak to the benefits that we put into our plan for the town um, with respect to what we're willing to give. Um, it was the task was put on us to come back and and um, basically articulate what we were willing to provide the town. Uh, so uh, first and foremost, um, obviously we plan to participate in the, the town's three percent um, local excise tax. We plan to pay that. Um, Secondly, um, we have already opened up um, annual meetings uh, every July with a select board or a designee that's written in just to give updates on where we're at as an organization, how the Tewksbury, how are things going with the location, how are things running, et cetera. So we're very open to those meetings. Um, as far as how long those continue, we're open to that, whether that be a fixed period of time or go on indefinitely. We're fine either way with that. Um, and we've got incredible relations with uh, the Drake at town folks. So um, we'd have, we expect to have the same type of relationship here, very open kimono and uh, very open relationship. Um, as far as community outreach and mitigation, um, the goal would be to hold our own separate community outreach meeting um, for the first two years, at least annually, um, to just make sure that we're calling out to the local abutters and just asking how they feel things are going. So that's also written into our HCA. Um, community giving is a big thing for us. Um, we're going to show you in the next slide some of the groups that we're working with, but we just wrapped up um, the LGH Cancer Walk, raised over $5,000 for LGH just this year. We've been a contributor a number of years in a row, but this year was a great year for us in terms of giving for, for that cause. Um, so, I mean, that one cause would have fulfilled half of our, our, our first year's um, uh, target, um, but not every, not every uh, opportunity is like that. But our first year, we're committing to $10,000 in annual giving. Um, I'm sorry, in giving, uh, community giving. And in two years and beyond, to hit at least 15000 That would be our mark every year. Okay. Um, we also in Drake it successfully run a Main Street cleanup project every year with the town's uh, help um, and participation. It's an awesome event. Um, the town looks forward to it every year. 
So um, we'd like to propose something very similar here. We've actually written it into the HCA and we'd like to offer that to the town. Um, community education is going to be a big thing. Education is a big part of what we do anyway, but community education and educating the local community on how we do things and the ups and the positives and negatives of, uh, of drug use, for instance. Okay, so we'll have written pamphlets. There'll be material available in store um, for, for people to access should they feel they need to you know, go a little further with that. Um, we talked about security, um, but one of the things we didn't mention was that, and that's in, written into our HCA, is that we're willing to dedicate two cameras um, towards the main entrance into Main Street um, and give access to the local police department should they deem that something that they feel is beneficial. So if they want some an extra set of eyes to be watching that that set of lights there, or um, uh, or just that section of Main uh, of Main Street, then we're willing to install those extra security cameras and give access to the town um, to, to manage those. Um, and then as far as the impact fee, finally, we're not you know the, the, there's some new legislation out there that restricts municipalities from asking for a three percent um, or a percentage based uh, model of gross revenue or, or, or of revenue period. Um, so. Although we can't do that, what we have proposed in our low, in our HCA, um, our proposed HCA, is that in the event the town does deem that there are expenses directly attributed to the operation of our business that are having a negative impact at the town level, then we want to know about it, and we would be willing to address those issues and fix them up to a certain up to that three percent that the town would have normally gotten anyway. So we can't say, we're gonna give you 3%. What we can say is, if you guys come to us and say, listen, there, there's this, this constant issue that we're having as a result of your business being there, and we've done some research, and, we've, and we know it's gonna cost X, then that's gonna be on us to fix it, okay? So that's what we're willing to do for the town. As far as local, uh, just for our charitable partners, um, we work very closely with the Merrimack Valley Food Bank. They're one of our largest partners that we work with. Um, the Drake Food Pantry, the Lowell Association for the Blind, the Clean River Project, the um, uh, Afro Afro American Community Collaboration, Dollars for Scholars, Noah's Way. There's a bunch of small local Drake people that we like to do stuff with too. But most of our giving you're going to find is concentrated into the greater Lowell area. That is the area in this region of things that has been deemed an area of disproportionate impact and the area that most of the partners of people that are applying here are going to be looking to sort of hone in and, and give do a, focus a lot of their charitable giving in those areas because they get credit for it as a part of the uh, benchmarks that we're held to um, as a part of our licensing with the state. Uh, one other point in terms of the investment in the facility. Yes. Um, so as far as um, costs for this project here, we're we're already we're looking at this budget. Uh, we have about two million dollars allocated for this project. Um, we, unlike um, almost everybody in uh, anybody else in cannabis, do have access to funding. And the reason we have access to funding, although we could write the check ourselves, we we're going to use the bank's money because they're willing to give it to us at this point. So. Um, you know, the thing is that not a lot of people in cannabis are able to go out and just talk to a lender and get money. So that in and of itself should speak volumes about where we are at fiscally, like financially speaking, and as far as managing our back end books and so forth, we basically operate a level under audited financials regularly, and we have an incredibly detailed focus on making sure that financials are immaculate at all times. So I'll just leave with that. All right, I appreciate that, and thank you for the thorough presentation. All right, let me turn to my colleagues and um, see if there's any specific questions that they have. Yep. Ms. Wellman. Thank you. Thank you for your complete presentation. Um, you answered a bunch of my questions through that process, so I appreciate that. I wanted to look at your marketing plan. Um, page 22 of your marketing plan, um, you identify as a high priority to market to young adult males age 18 to 25. And I was curious why you're marketing to people that are under age. I'm sorry? Can, I, can, can we read so that again? Plan. Your high priority are young adult males because they buy vaporizers, high potency extracts, ages 18 to 25. This is on page 22 of your application. Yeah, I think that's that's data that's been taken from a source. That's not data that we're representing that ourselves. Using so information from market studies and Lazy River Products own market expertise, management will target customers as follows. Page 22. Okay. Well, then that's somewhat misrepresented. That's what I'll say. It's a Scrivener's error. I'm sorry? A Scrivener's error, perhaps? Well, I, I can... I can just tell you that we, the data that we pulled for any of that planning was pulled from, from, from actual sources. So sure, I know it no, cites it's that. It's a detailed 
market analysis. Yeah, but obviously the law doesn't rec allow us to sell to people under the age of 18, yeah. you know, so well, it's not people uh, that we're, we're actively targeting because that would be illegal and we wouldn't be in business if we were doing that. So I understand the question and I understand that there's a mistake in the plan, but that's not, uh, that's not, we're not marketing products to people that are underage. Sure. I, and that's why I was asking the question yep. because this is your presentation to yes. us. Mm -hmm. So I don't know which part is. My apologies. There was clearly an issue there, and that's, that's on us. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I was interested in your location, and you answered that question completely. And I was encouraged by that um, information. Uh, and I understood that you were paying um, dark rent there earlier. Um, and I like the explanation that you gave to us. Um, I noticed the other question I want to talk to you about is your pricing. Your pricing for an eighth tends to be a little bit higher than your competitors in this area. Mm -hmm. And so I wondered, you talked a little bit about quality. I'm wondering about your competitive advantage because we're interested in any organization that's going to be located here will be successful in yeah. Tewksbury and in the market. So can you talk a little bit I about can. that? I can. I'm excited you asked that question because I think this is uh, something that the town should be very focused on too, um, to see what's hype happening with price compression in major markets. Um, because you know that should give the town some indication of how flexible they should try to be for with, for instance, hours of operation, things like that, okay, yeah. so that we can be competitive. Um, but I'll just I'll, I'll just say that um, uh, and I'm sorry, I just had a little bit of a flurry there in my head there. So I, could you just recite the question one more time just so I'm so addressing it properly? My question was I noticed that the price for an eighth yeah, is, a little is, is a little bit yeah. higher than your competitors. Yeah. So, so the, 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 the reason it's important for the, from the town's perspective, I think, to, to also ask, be asking this question to everybody that's applying is because you're getting a 3% tax on what people are charging for their products. And there are a number of providers that are coming in here and applying that are established that are only interested to get to the bottom as fast as possible because that's their only angle to get new customers because they're just retailers. So they're, they're all selling everybody else's products. A lot of times they're selling the same people's products. So if I've got a guy right down the street who's selling the same branded product and we both have access to it and we're both competing for the same customers, who, you know, I mean, is it, is it benefit, you know, what, what are they gonna do to be more competitive? They're gonna just continually undercut their pricing. And we see this in every major market in Massachusetts right now happening. And you've got a lot of guys in here that are only interested in coming in here to lock up a location and drop their price to the absolute floor. And how does that impact the town? It cuts into your 3%. Why is that different for Lazy River products? And why, how, for, I think the question is, how are we able to charge as much as we do for an eighth? The reason is because we're a destination location. And the real reason is because of that guy right there. Because he's the, one of the only guys operating in Massachusetts cannabis with 25 years of legal experience. And the stuff that we're doing is very different from how other people are doing it. We're growing very select genetics because of Kevin's exceptional relationships with guys on the West Coast who send us their genetics. Okay, but they don't send them to just anybody. So we're able to grow stuff that people seek out and are looking for, and that's how we're able to charge the money we do. When 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 people were undercutting their prices and prices were going down to twenty five dollar and from twenty five dollars an eighth, we put out a brand new product called our Reserve line of flour. That that product that eighth sold for close to seventy dollars. Okay. It sold for sixty five. We still have that product on our shelves today, and anything that Kevin grows that we deem to be exceptional goes in that reserve jar. And when we drop a brand new cultivar in that glass jar, even though it's $65 out the door, people line up for it. And that's the difference, okay? And that, that, that's the real benefit to the town is that by bringing in a quality operator who can control quality and actually has control over the products that they're bringing in, you know, that, that's, that's far more beneficial for the town. And, and also with respect to where the town is placing these locations, I think is also something that needs to be really just thought about. You know, stacking these places on top of each other is not the way to do this thing. So that's, I'll just, I didn't mean to butt in there. I'm just no, throwing that out there. I, have, I appreciate the comment. I have one final question, sure. Mr. Chairman. Um, Drake is very close by. And I read your, your range of your customers and within five miles, it's 184,000. So I thought your analysis was good and I appreciated that. Um, but why so close to Drake it? Because we want to own Lowell. Okay. That's why. Because we want to own the whole market up here. 
Um, and I think what you find a lot of other guys doing very early on, um, which was always a part of their strategy and obviously not a part of our strategy, was to just target the, the biggest markets that they could and just drop one location in different parts of the state. So you got guys with a place up here in the North Shore, you got some you got the same company with a place down in the South Shore and a, and a place out in Western Mass. So from a management perspective, I mean, I, ran, I had 20 locations in my previous business, mm -hmm. and the goal was to always try to keep those locations within a close enough proximity to each other where we could overlap marketing strategies and areas um, and not completely decimate or cannibalize the traffic from the other location, okay, but, you know, but still, you know, but have a presence there and really build up a, a sort of a, a, a larger area of influence. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any questions, Mr. Hall? I just have a couple. I'll keep it brief, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, have you, being in Drake, have you had any violations for manufacturing and or selling to miners or anything? None at all. Okay. That's kind of important. Absolutely. Um, the other thing is, I saw your little flow chat there with the executive. Do you have in-house training or? Oh, yes. It's all in-house, you don't outsource it. We don't outsource, uh, barely, we don't outsource anything, really, and, and, at all. Um, all, of the, all of the training programs that we devised for our in-house staff, so any, anybody that was an existing employee coming on or any new employees that are coming on, are all trained through a program that we devised ourselves. Not to say that there aren't state programs. There is an RVT program that was mentioned in that last um, presentation. These are required trainings that the state makes these people take to give them a general overview of the business. But that is completely separate from our training that we also do on top of that to make sure that our um, CSRs or customer service representatives are some of the most educated in the business. You know, because our people are literally out on the floor and we encourage them to be interacting with our customers with, with iPads and talking to our customers to understand what their needs are and then make recommendations off of those needs. We're, we're not like a regular store. That's what I'll just say. It's not just about the quick flip trying to get a buck on somebody coming and buying a joint. We take the time and invest in our customers to understand what they're really here for, what their needs are, and then we really match products to customers' needs. That's our job. Okay, thank you. And you can only do that with education and training, to your point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kraven, anything? Yes. Yeah. You were talking about uh, employees and how many employees you have to be thought of possible employees if they qualify. Um, what was the average pay for employees that were making if they were working at market capital? Great question. Um, our minimum rate of pay is $18 an hour. Okay. That's where we start everybody, which is well above industry average, which I'll say. Mm -hmm. Most people are not, not, not to say that people don't charge 18, because there are people in this area that will charge 18, but those, most, most of those people got that from us. Um, and we, we pay our people well, because we like to keep our resources. Oh, yeah. I mean, that seems to be one of the issues that a lot of local businesses have, getting employees, and I mean, just saw the numbers is talking yeah. 1925, mm -hmm. just to try to get people to work on the passages. Yeah. The rate is going up, it's just a Yeah, the rate is going up, it just, uh, I was just curious, because yep. you're talking about if they're qualified, and, and then uh, Mr. Holland mentioned about training. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're having difficulty getting employees, is there some training provided to the local community that would give them the training necessary to work there? Like, would you provide some sort of, you know, if somebody wanted to apply there, you need 35 people, you're having difficulty fill, filling those positions? Would you go and do, uh, you know, some sort of training? Absolutely. Okay. And we'd go as far as to hold job fairs if we really needed to and qualify those people out in the field and then bring them in. And we don't need, it's retail. I think that's the, the one benefit is that it's retail. Um, and <clears throat> as long as people have general customer service experience, then we can do the rest with our training program for the most part. Um, Remember, cannabis is somewhat of a new industry here in Massachusetts, so there's not a lot of really, uh, not a lot of experts. There's a lot of new people that need this education, and that's, you know, because ours is so thorough, um, it gives them a huge head start when they're coming on board with us. Okay, um, the other thing is, uh, I, I saw that, uh, you know, you have a existing facility, which is great. Mm -hmm. So you can give a little bit more information uh, to us. What is the, uh, do you have like peak months that, yeah, I mean, I heard one of the people talk about like a lot, you get a lot of business at early in the morning and then when people get out of work, but are there some months that are higher than others? Is there any months? kind of analysis that's been done? Mm -hmm. It's like, do you get a lot during the summertime compared to the winter time or is, is there, or is it just a free flow? 
And it's, I'm not, we're not sure of this type of business. Yeah, we have a very consistent flow of traffic in Drake. It's very consistent and very predictable. That's what I'll say. We do have busier months than other months, and we can directly attribute months like December to be some of our better months. Why? Because Christmas, the holiday, gifting, things like that. Um, we also see a spike in traffic because we're a big uh, event group. We like to do, like in Drake, we do a lot of things for the community where we feed the community for free. They can come and we entertain them. They can come down for our Riverfest events. We bring Bring in live music. We throw. We invest thousands of dollars pitching huge tents, bringing in live music acts, bringing in food trucks, and allowing people to come in and eat for free and be entertained and shop. And so, th there are times when we're doing those sorts of activities too that also dramatically bump um, the traffic because the community loves that kind of stuff. So, um, but yes. Yeah, so, depending on what months we're running those events, that might also sort of. Uh, uh, have an effect on, on traffic on a given month, but really December is the big month, and then we do have other months that are a little busier than others, but again, for the most part, very predictable, very predictable traffic for us at this point. Oh, and like you said, $14 million a year, that means a lot of trip generations that are going through, but mm -hmm. it is a signalized intersection, but prior to that location being signalized, you know, we had details working down there because of certain months that gets very busy in that plaza. And so that's why I was asking, is there specific times that may happen where, you know, there is two entrances to that. You have a signalized intersection, but you have another one that isn't. Um, and, you know, at, at times we may need an officer out there. If it gets all of a sudden the numbers start going out and there isn't, you know, you can only do so much, you know, yeah, timing to a signal, moving people in out, where if it gets really busy during peak holiday season, things like that, we may need somebody out there to work to make sure traffic is flowing, which we've done in the past. So if that's ever a case, then we would sort of deem that to fall within the um, HCA stipulation that we put in there with regards to the impact fee. That's how we sort of view that. Um, but I will say that, um, you know, I mean, do you want to think? Yeah, well, it's, it's pretty good. You know, we're, we, we know what the uh, number of transactions are per day per week, per month, and it, and it you know, like William mentioned, um, depending on the events that we're having, but also depending on what um, various promos are happening on a particular day, like the Med Monday, and we've got things happening on, you know, Wednesday, and of course Thursday going into the weekend, but some days are all slower, so we've got, we've got numbers related to, to that that we can definitely share with you folks. Yeah. Yeah. I can also, that may be something that we'll be reaching out to ask additional questions yeah. on that. We also, um, in planning, obviously, um, had um, Steve from Merrimack Engineering Group um, do a, a, an audit, basically, on the parking situation, and I think that we had determined that even if every single business had, was at their maximum capacity for what they were allowed to accommodate for customers, that that parking lot still would have plenty of availabilities in terms of available parking spots. So, um, and that's something that's on the plans. Yeah, one other point just to make in terms of Drake, the Drake operation, there's no signal control there. It's on a fairly busy road, one through 113, and there's been virtually no backup, no issues whatsoever uh, with existing uh, business operations. Mm -hmm. All right. I want to try to bring it in for a landing. Do you have any other questions, sir? Oh, yeah, sir. Thank you. All right. Um, you've whittled it down to two questions. That's the problem with going last. Um, you mentioned um, uh, your facilities in Drakeit. You answered some questions about that. Um, talk to me about your physical presence, the three of you in this town. Yeah, I think that's great. What's your plan? The plan is to be splitting our, I mean, we're, we're planning to, there's gonna be a need for us to be down here um, actively at the very beginning, obviously. And right. for, for, for probably the first year, there's gonna be a large presence here um, until we can get some established resources in place and make sure that those people are running the facility the way it should be run. Um, so I would say um, it's going to be very, very, you're gonna see a lot of us mm -hmm. uh, for the first year. Um, after that, it's not that you're not gonna see us. We, we are all three of us actively involved in our businesses every single day. And I think that's another big important part Nobody's up here. I mean, George is, you know, he, he, he works with us, but there's the three of us are in the, the facility every single day running the operations of this company and making sure that it's okay. it's going to succeed. All right. And, um, and you heard me ask uh, the prior applicant this question, but um, anyone on your uh, ownership group have any involvement with any other applicants here? No, we don't. Right? And we, and we okay. don't plan on getting involved with anybody else in the event uh, we don't get this license. Okay. Very good. Okay, those are my questions for tonight. Um, and this is a public hearing as we, we know. So I just, um, a number of people walked in after you started 
Let me just ask if there's anyone in the room that wants to speak to this particular application. Nope. Oh, okay. Um, so with that, let me ask my colleagues, uh, similar to the last hearing, if there's a motion to continue this hearing to July 18, in case we have additional questions, um, so and we can invite uh, these applicants back. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. All right. Uh, moved and seconded by Mr. Crapman, seconded by Ms. Wellman. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? I'll vote in the affirmative as well. So that's a four to zero vote. Um, and uh, we will certainly be following up. Outstanding. Right. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay. Let's move to our third hearing. Um, I see folks are ready, so that's good. Grab a seat. That's fine. Thank you. All right. Um, so let me read the hearing notice. Um, and then I'll offer some comments for the benefit of those people who weren't in the room when we started the evening. Um, so notice is hereby given that the select board will conduct a public hearing in accordance with select board regulation 37 marijuana retail sales license policies and regulations on June 12, 2023 at 8 p.m. at Town Hall, 1009 Main Street, Tewksbury, Mass, 01876 on the application of Full Harvest Moons, Inc., for a license to operate as a marijuana retailer on premises located at 1 Main Street, Tewksbury, Massachusetts, consisting of an area of approximately 1,680 square foot building. And as always, we invite input from the public. It will be uh, recommended to be submitted in writing by Thursday, June 8. We have um, an abutters list uh, for the record, um, notification to about, I don't know, six to 10 uh, abutters. And we also have a copy of the um, legal notice that was posted on uh, May 24, 2023. Um, so I know some of you uh, were not in the room when I started the evening, and um, so far we're doing okay. It's 8 o'clock. We were scheduled for 8 o'clock. Um, so I'm going to ask you for the same approach and courtesies as we asked the prior two applicants, and I intend to throughout this process over the next week or so. Um, but what we'd like you to do, if you can, is be concise, to the point, tell us what we need to know. We've all taken the time to read what you submitted. Um, so we're interested in hearing what um, you believe is important for us to absorb and take into consideration. Um, so please be as efficient as you can. I'd like to try to limit that if possible to about 15 minutes. Then it's gonna give my colleagues some time to ask you some questions. And ultimately, there's a few people behind you who all seem to walk in at the same time. So they may or may not have some comments, and we want to hear what they have to say. But I don't know about you, but my days start early. I'd like to be out of here as close to 9 o'clock as we possibly can. So You'll get no um, argument so here. So work with me. Work with me, okay? And I'm going to ask my colleagues to work with me. Um, and what I want to stress, again, because um, you didn't have the benefit of being in the room, we're only doing fact-finding tonight. We're, we're not going to be deliberating. We're not making decisions this evening. We have a, a lengthy process to follow here because we have um, actually, I think, six others that we have yet to speak to um, over the next week. Um, and now we're heading into the peak of summer, and people are in vacations and things of that nature. So um, this is going to be a little bit of a process. You just heard me close or uh, continue the last hearing. We're going to do the same with you, presuming my colleagues are in agreement. Um, and that will give us an opportunity to regroup with you on any follow-ups. Okay? Sure. Yep. So thank you for that. Um, so let me ask you first, the three of you, to introduce yourselves so our recording secretary can capture that because she's somewhere in cyberspace. Yeah, and just speak into the microphone sure. for me. Um, my name is Janet Kupris. I'm the CEO of Full Harvest Moons. 
We are a uh, certified women-owned business in the state of Massachusetts, and we currently have two stores operating, one in Haverhill, uh, on 95 Plastow Road and one in Lowell uh, that we just opened November 1st of 22, uh, 1201 Westford Street in Lowell. And Haverhill store has been open for just about almost two and a half years now. Okay. So, who's next? Uh, my name is Jesse Moberg. I am uh, the architect for all three of the Full Harvest Boons locations. Uh, we are, my firm is Caveney Architectural Collaborative. We're based in Lowell, Massachusetts. Um, I am a cannabis architect specifically, so I only work on cannabis jobs, several hundred dispensaries over the course of many years, um, so very well versed in the rules and regulations of what these types of facilities require. Terrific. Thank you and welcome. Um, my name is Phil Silverman. I'm from the Vicente Law Firm. Uh, we're here representing uh, Full Harvest Moons. Um, my firm is... Uh, uh, it's the nation's only cannabis law firm. We're a national law firm. We have offices in every state where cannabis is legalized. Uh, and here in Massachusetts, we represent over 150 businesses. And so of the 300 retailers that are open in Massachusetts, we actually represent over 100 of them. Um, and what we do, the reason why we're somewhat popular, is we specialize in what we call compliance. Um, and we make sure that all of the regulations and the laws that govern uh, operating these businesses are followed with, with great precision, quite frankly. Um, if you haven't figured it out, and I suspect you have, because you've heard from a lot of people, uh, the, the, the mechanics of running a retail business like this, it's not that complicated, okay? It's a retail business. It's not that different uh, from a liquor store or a pharmacy or a convenience store. What is different is compliance, that you've got a lot of rules, regulations that you've got to comply with, you've got to do it the right way. And I think that's really, I would think, what the town is looking for because of the nature of this, and it's a somewhat controversial industry, obviously, but you want this done the right way. Uh, you don't want product disappearing out the back door. You don't want people getting in that are too young to be in the store. You don't want waste to be disposed of in the wrong manner where somebody's gonna come across the dumpster and be uh, going in there. It's really important that all of these rules get followed. And that's where we come in, that's what we help. Mass Massachusetts does have the strictest regulation uh, in the country as far as this, and that's why actually the rollout of legalization of marijuana has been pretty good in Massachusetts, it really has. You haven't seen uh, a ton of problems. And, and we like to think that we play a role in that because we, we train our, uh, our customers, our clients, and their employees, we work with them. We teach them the security procedures, the safety procedures, how every log has to be filled out. Everything that the Cannabis Control Commission is looking for, that's what we teach. Um, and then what we do is over time we monitor it. Um, whether it's just you know making sure, calling people, making sure that a report is filed on time, or even showing up for spot checks. Sometimes the clients don't like it, but we show up unannounced and we uh, take a look around because we want to make sure they're following the rules all the time not just when they know we're coming. Uh, so that's, that's what we do, and I, I always try to give a little understanding because I think it's important to, to the operation. So um, going from there, uh, as you can see from the rendering, uh, what we're proposing to do at One this? Main Street, so I can same thing, around. same thing. We thought we'd make it easy for you. Thank you. Sure. Um, one Main Street, this is in the general business and interstate, over, uh, interstate overlay district. Um, you can see that rendering. Uh, we're, we're taking uh, uh, a building that uh, is not quite as nice as this one, let's say, and we're trying to make this a state-of-the-art uh, building. We'll optimize this site for its highest and best use. And we're going to be operating that from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. daily, and we'll sell the, the full array of all of the cannabis products that if you've, if you've actually visited uh, one of these stores, you'll see in, in most of these places. It was, will be, of course, sales only to people age 21 years of age and older. Next slide. Uh, so our mission here, again, um, state certified women business enterprise, and our goal is to provide safe and secure as, uh, access to cannabis products. Um, this company is well suited to do that. It's doing it successfully uh, in, its, in its Haverhill location. It's working uh, in, in Lowell, Massachusetts. This, there's a good track record here of doing this the right way, uh, and, and that's what we're after here. Next slide, please. Um, did introduce you already to Janet. Um, 
unfortunately, our security chief, Mike Allen, couldn't be here. Mike uh, was formerly the chief of police up in Rochester, New Hampshire. More recently, he's been working in cannabis uh, in the state. I, if he has not been involved in the most of any security expert in Massachusetts, probably more than just about anybody in terms of getting these places open, up and running, he's been very popular. He knows a lot about the industry, uh, and he is working with us um, to, to make sure that this is, again, a safe and secure <coughs> environment. Um, next slide. <coughs> so given that, as I mentioned before, um, the important thing here is running this in a compliant manner. Uh, it's really imperative that the entire staff of the company buys into that goal. And the way you get the entire staff to buy into that goal is that you have an employee-centered approach to the business. So we'll have about 30 full-time employees here. Uh, most are going to be hired locally. That's really important because, again, if you're local, you want this to be run right. It's your community. You don't want this to become an eyesore. You don't want this to become a bother to the community. So we really do try to hire locally. Of course, we do try also to hire from a diversity of backgrounds. Uh, they're paid a living wage. I think, you know, at a minimum, you'll see $18 an hour, but it does go up from there. Uh, they get comprehensive benefits, and they get substantial training, and there are opportunities within this company for advancement. Um, again, the numbers you're seeing low, a million dollars in capital, liquid capital, I think we showed you a bank statement. That's a little unusual, um, but it's important. Um, the history of cannabis in Massachusetts is everybody goes through these processes, they get a license, and then it just sits there because people never really had the money. Um, and they think, well, I'll be able to go out and find the money, or a bank's going to loan it to me. Maybe they will, but things happen. Uh, economic downturns happen. Banks decide, eh, we don't want to get further exposed. This company has the money. Uh, this project is probably an $800,000 project to get the building renovated. Um, and they've got a million and more in the bank. There's no risk uh, here that the project won't get built and built quickly. Um, just in terms of some of the other numbers that I think are important, 300,000 compliant transactions, that means 300,000 customer transactions um, without a hitch. Zero incidents of noncompliance or regulatory deficiencies. Never had a problem with the Cannabis Control Commission. Um, two licenses uh, in good standing in Massachusetts. We have 41 employees and quite a bit of experience, uh, both from the staff and, and the consultants that are on board here in terms of doing this the right way. Next slide, please. So just quickly on the buffers, I know you have, a, and, and the state have a 500 foot buffer from schools K through 12. Uh, this is not located within 500 feet of a school K through 12. I think the closest school is over a half mile away. I think it's 0.7 miles away. Um, next slide, please. All right, now we get to, to the uh, specifics of the site. Uh, I'll, I'll give it to the pro. Jesse, why don't you take that one? Sure. Uh, so we have gone through the site plan approval process, as have all applicants, I believe, at this point. So I won't rehash all the details, but to give you a kind of a broad overview, uh, we are located at 1 Main Street, which is right off of 495. It's currently an operational service, uh, vehicle service center and auto sales. It's the Simon Auto Center. Um, this picture is a little bit older, so it has had a few improvements. There's a big sign up top that says Simon's, and the parking lot is packed with cars at the moment. Um, we have about 1,680 square feet of interior space, as well as an enclosed exterior loading area for loading and unloading of product. Um, the proposed site, which you can see on the renderings, I also have a, an animation that will play at the end that'll give you a little bit more context. Uh, we have one-way circulation around the building, so as you enter the parking lot from the existing curb cut, the circulation puts everybody around the building in that fashion so that you don't have a traffic backup with cars waiting to park out onto Main Street right there. Um, this was all worked out with the planning board. Uh, they have full buy-in on, on the site plan. Um, just wanted to make sure we updated all this information before we presented it to you. Um, we've also done a comprehensive traffic study for the site as well. Um, there are a handful of conditions that need to be satisfied with that, but most of those are involving the mass DOT and the um, future construction project on Main Street right there. Um, so we can't actually give you an answer on that until we get a hold of Mass DOT and get that planning underway with them. Um, we are at two, um, two traffic lights at this intersection. It is a major commercial corridor. 
We have a car dealership next door. There's a grocery store across the street, uh, fast food. And right after our site is the on-ramp onto 495. So we'll be able to show you that again in, in just a minute. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, well above the parking required for zoning. Um, we do have employee parking space kind of in the back. We have a bike rack proposed on the site. We have a full-size dumpster with a locking enclosure in the back um, in compliance with the CCC regulations for security and, and trash storage. Um, there is an existing propane tank on the back of the site that will be removed um, with the direction of the fire department at that time. It's part of the service center. Um, and then in terms of the exterior improvements to the building itself, um, we're trying to, again, to give it its highest and best use here. So as of right now, it's it's kind of a, it looks like a service station. It's, it's got a two big garage bays in the front, uh, has some faux masonry around the outside. Um, so we're reusing the existing structure, the existing framing of the building itself. Uh, we're gonna fill in those garage doors with some glazing, uh, new siding, new masonry, and then a parapet up top, which will not only you know give a little bit more visibility for, for signage, but it will hide any equipment that needs to go on the roof because we don't want to have any equipment at grade on the site. Um, so we can get into, on the next one, a little bit more about the actual architecture of it. Oh, uh, there's site plan. Uh. Got that was on there. Um, so this is the site plan. It's a screenshot from the actual approved site plans so with a little grainy, but essentially coming off of Main Street here, uh, single direction turn into the site, circulation around the building. We have sidewalks and pedestrian pathways to take you from the parking spaces to the building itself. The main entry door that's there now will be the same location as the entry and exit door in the new use. Uh, we have a lot of signage and directional striping on the asphalt itself. Um, we have some curb uh, wheel stops at the existing sidewalk area. We imagine that this full sidewalk here will be part of that mass DOT project. Um, there is a curb cut next to us for access to a site that is not ours, so we can't actually do anything with that at the moment. Um, but generally speaking, plenty of parking, designated areas for snow storage, uh, single direction traffic, and we do have a restricted right turn only coming out of the site back onto Main Street. For the interior of the building, um, we're keeping it pretty simple. The building itself is a little over 1,600 square feet, which is relatively small for a dispensary. Um, we have main entry, so this is the customer entry and exit point. When you walk in the door, there may be a little uh, consultation, a couple of chairs or something, as you can kind of see in the rendering. If you want to browse the menu, maybe talk to a bud tender. ID check will happen at the reception desk before anybody can get past this vestibule. They have to be let into the sales floor by the reception person post ID check. And we can get into that process on the security slide. Uh, sales floor is pretty wide open. Uh, we have a little alcove up here for display. Um, that matches the full harvest aesthetic from their other locations. Um, we have five points of sale, um, one of which is dedicated ADA only. Uh, the rest are, you know, mixed. A uh, little bit of back bar decoration for, for product storage and inventory. And then the back of house is pretty typical. Uh, we have a little order fulfillment area. We have a secure storage room, security and IT room, um, both of which are built to the standards of the Cannabis Control Commission. We have a small employee break room, a couple of offices, a toilet for employees only, some general storage. And then you can see out of the back, um, at the Simon Service Center, there is an existing low retaining wall. It's about 18 inches, about knee height. That's where that sort of heavy double line is. We plan to build in that same location. It's just gonna be a screening fence so they can pull a van into this receiving area and load it and unload it without any visibility from the parking lot. Uh, we also have just a couple of you know, small plastic storage sheds. We don't have much storage room inside, so this will be for toilet paper, receipt paper, bags, um, non-cannabis only. All right. Uh, I just wanted to comment also, uh, you know, on the site. We lo I loved this site when I first saw it. Um, you know, these, these places do become uh, destinations, okay? People, every one of them has a little different mix of their products. So people from other communities do come to these places. And I think 
that's what you want. You're getting 3% uh, of the sales revenue through a tax on, on this, so you want to encourage that. But I think it's nice that this is right off the highway. People can come in, they don't have to go through town, create a lot of traffic, they come in, they buy, they, they get right off again. So uh, between that and the parking, the 22 parking spaces, it's really fantastic parking. Um, used to be an issue, everybody sure. early on saw all the traffic jams at these places when, when cannabis first came to Massachusetts. That's gone now. You've got 300 retailers in Massachusetts. Um, so with 22 spaces and bearing in mind that every transaction is about an eight to 10 minute process, you turn over that parking lot five times in an hour. So this could handle 100 customers. You won't get that even at the busiest of times, but it, you also won't have any, even, even at a busy time, you won't have big traffic problems here. Again, good traffic flow and the amount of parking. Um, so now to get into uh, some of the financials. Um, again, I mentioned a uh, million dollars in liquid assets, $800,000 uh, to open the facility. And, and there you have the bank statement that's showing you the type of funding on hand, uh, which is substantial. Go ahead. All right, so uh, Mike Allen, Director of Security, is not here, so I'm going to present in his stead. I do not have the same calming demeanor as he does, but we'll just pretend for right now. Um, so we have a state-of-the-art security system here. Uh, it is structurally the same security system being used at the other locations. The exact equipment may differ, but the performance is the same. Um, so we have perimeter security around the entire building and site. That would include motion sensors, uh, alarms, and video surveillance that covers the entire perimeter of the interior and exterior of the building. Um, we have electronic access control at all doors to restricted areas. We have panic alarms that are located strategically throughout the facility and sometimes carried by employees. Um, there will be motion sensors, glass breaks, and door contacts at all exterior fenestrations of the building so that if something does happen, it's immediately <coughs> triggered in the security system. Um, per the Cannabis Control Commission regulations, we also have 24 seven um, HD video surveillance that is backed up for 90 days off site. Um, this will be, lo the, the video coverage for this is on the exterior of the facility and any rooms inside the interior that will contain cannabis. Um, so obviously not in the bathrooms, if it's a private office that will have no cannabis. Um, those are the only kind of areas that would not be covered. Footage is stored for a minimum of 90 days. Again, that's off site. And we will have a full generator backup of the security system in compliance with the CCC regulations. Um, in terms of alarms, we have duress, panic, and hold up alarms that will be located throughout the facility, wherever the security um, director deems the best locations are. We will have multiple redundant alarm systems that ensure that there will be no failure to the security system in case of a power outage or any kind of service disruption. Um, Security guards will be monitoring the live feed of the security system 24 seven, and the police department will also have 24 seven real time access to our security system if they decide they want it. Um, access control, so we manage a lot of access control through levels of security within the building itself. So kind of level one is an area where a customer could get in, level two is an area that's staff only, but not all staff, and then level three would be restricted personnel only, usually a general manager or, or the business owner itself. Um, so that would be security rooms, product storage areas. Um, and this is all controlled by key fobs or card readers and door hardware. Uh, limited access. So the CCC has some pretty strict restrictions on what needs to be limited access and what does not. Um, in addition to that, the security director will make recommendations to those levels of security that we just talked about. Um, who needs to have access to which rooms and what their authorization levels and training are required to be. Um, for limited access for customers in particular, so nobody below the age of 21 is allowed in the building. Um, IDs are checked at the reception desk. It's a visual inspection, but they also use um, card reader technology to verify that those are not fake IDs. Um, and there will be a requirement that out-of-state IDs have to have a backup uh, method of ID if they want to make a purchase. Um, IDs are checked at reception. They're also checked again as you're at the point of sale getting ready to make your purchase. Um, in terms of maintenance, so all the security system and security equipment is maintained in good working order at all times. This is a CCC requirement, but also subject to internal audit by the security director. So this is, again, the same, structurally the same security system at the other two locations, and they have had zero violations. 
Uh, we've won, run through a few of these already, but access control um, in terms of IDs, we just went through that. I won't rehash that for you. Employee protocol, um, there is special training and controls in place internally um, to prevent diversion of marijuana by <laughs> employees. Um, so there is a seed to sale tracking system that literally tracks every single product from the time it's planted to the mm -hmm. time it's sold. Um, that being audited helps to make sure that there is no product diversion on the employee side. Um, there is extensive training um, about diversion, both from employees and from customers through all facets of operation. That's facility access, that's sales, chain of custody and security. Um, and all employees are subject to that training. If any employee intentionally or negligently sells to somebody under 21, that is um, an immediate termination and reporting to the Cannabis Control Commission as needed. And the uh, company will only hire individuals who are 21 years or older. Uh, public health outcomes. There's a study of the AMA regulated to cannabis, um, essentially leading that better, better education on marijuana use prevents underage use in a lot of circumstances. Um, the Cannabis Control Commission has a More About Marijuana campaign that Full Harvest participates in, which seeks to reduce youth use and access to cannabis. Um, these policies and programs will be available to all customers on site and um, geared towards parents, youth, and community members. You will be able to pick up this information at the store or um, request it, and it will be given to you. Mm -hmm. So again, as a result of these policies, there have been zero incidents of diversion within their other two locations. Uh, lastly, we'll talk about nuisance. So there will be a 24-7 contact number available to the police, any interested abutters, nearby residents, civic associations, um, and the town in general, so that if there are any concerns, they can be communicated and addressed in real time uh, with people running the facility. The general manager of the facility will attend all local neighborhood meetings and get feedback from the community so they're aware of any issues happening in the community so they can be addressed internally. Um, external security personnel will be employed to ensure that there is safe access to the site, both for vehicles, uh, pedestrians, and people on bicycles. Um, they will also monitor the exterior to make sure there's no loitering, no public consumption, no littering, sort of other just public nuisances. Um, we will also be designing the facility to mitigate noise, to mitigate odor. Um, there's not a lot of odor affiliated with dispensaries. The product is all mm -hmm. sealed before it gets to the facility. Um, but there is also uh, always that little concern from the public. Um, but part of that parapet design up top is to shield <coughs> noise um, from getting out to the main road. Uh, we also have done a photometric study that was part of the site plan review, which shows the light levels on our site and how they're not encroaching upon any neighboring properties. Um, there is absolutely no public consumption allowed on the site or in adjacent areas. And if there is ever an instance where a local official expresses concern, we will offer to provide video surveillance of those areas um, if it's under our purview to help mitigate that. Is that regulatory or your policy? Uh, no consumption. Outside, yeah. That is regulatory. It's regulatory. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, right. There's no public consumption anywhere in the state of Massachusetts. Got it. Um, so again, as a result of this policy, these have never been an issue at the other two locations. All right, that's great, Jesse. I think Chief Allen would be very pleased that you've obviously listened to him give this speech a number of times and are able to so I think we've recount done, uh, it. Uh, at least 25. Of these okay. <laughs> um, it's the only thing I wanted to add to that uh, in terms of security. Every one of these places is a little bit different. They all have slightly different security challenges. And the person that knows that best is the local police chief. We do intend to confer, uh, already have, and will continue to. We generally meet multiple times before you open and after just to find out how things are going as well so you can rest assured that those recommendations are taken seriously. Um, on the uh, local benefit side, uh, again, I, I've mentioned uh, this is substantial uh, uh, investment uh, in this site, uh, which obviously, you know, in, in 
increases the, the tax, taxable value of that property. Um, we've got a great track record in terms of 90% local and diverse hiring. I think that's a really important local benefit. The company does commit to 50 hours of local community services and other resources. Um, you know, there is uh, plenty of opportunities for um, charitable giving here. I, I think I heard the last group talking about there's some issues right now with HCAs and nobody's quite sure where that's going to go. I, I think what we would suggest to you is when the CCC clarifies that it would be important to sit down with the group and let's find out what the local community needs because I think this company showed a great willingness uh, to, to do some charitable giving and to provide other resources and make them available uh, for, for its local community. And, and finally, I think that uh, there, there's a benefit to the community for access for customers. I, I'm, I'm a big believer in legalization. I understand people's concerns about it, but I think the, 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 most of the studies that have come out in the places that have fully legalized are showing that it is having the intended effect. It's ha dampening down the black market, which is the primary source of this product for teens. It's not, you know, teen use has gone down in these communities. It hasn't gone down by a ton in most of these places, but it actually has gone down. The most it's gone down has been out west uh, in Colorado um, because it's been around the longest and it's had the, the greatest chance to take effect. So I, I think it's good for people to have a place where they can get product and they can get product that they know is independently tested and safe. Um, so that's, uh, next slide. Yeah, so the, the presentation, again, I'm just going to, you know, uh, rehash very quickly. Uh, fantastic location. You know, I, I love the highway location. This is uh, approved already by the planning board. We have the funding. And I think most importantly, you can rest assured that we're going to run a compliant uh, business that, that will make the town pleased that it decided to uh, allow these places in the first place because it's going to be done the right way. Thank you. Happy to answer any questions. Right. Thank you for that, uh, the three of you. Um, let me uh, open it up to my colleagues. Uh, any questions? I, I have a good question. Um, I understand, you, you know, uh, this is an excellent location that's next to 495, but I do have some concerns with the location. Um, anybody getting off of 495 is going to have to cross across, get across three lanes of traffic to enter this location because there's a left turn in going toward Clark Road, and then there's two lanes of travel going through there. So if anybody gets off the highway and tries to get into this location, they have to get across three little things. So that's pretty gonna be pretty difficult, unless it's you know, <coughs> off hours of what's going through there, because you know you got market basket and everything else that's there, which is pretty busy. So traffic's gonna have to go up into a hole, turn around, come back to get into this location. Exiting this location, uh, from what I can see on the plan, it looks like it's a right turn only. There's no left turn. Yes. So anybody going back to Lowell will come out of this driveway, go right, go back into Tewksbury further, have to spin around and head back to Lowell. So that's going to be another thing of there's not an easy real turnaround. It's going to be difficult for them because of the proximity and to, to get over to turn around on Clock Road. It's like it doesn't give you a lot of room to get over to that third lane to try to do that. So I, I, I do have some concerns with the traffic that's going in out of here. Even if you're getting 15 trips an hour, if people have to go about that extra turnaround because of the proximity to the ramp section. So I have some concerns with that. Uh, you know, I'll look more into it, but I just want to see more on that. Uh, the other question I had is, according to the plan, it looks like part of this parcel may be in low. Is, is this is this whole lot on Tewksbury? Because it looks like part of the parcel is located in Lowell. Is that correct? I can, uh, I can show you on the site. Um, uh, basically, the entire parcel is in Tewksbury, with the exception of the existing pylon sign. Um, you can see it on the site plan right here. Sorry, that was I rotated. So property line designating between Lowell and Tewksbury comes in right here. So our full driveway is all on Tewksbury property. The only part that's impacted, um, which would require potentially another permit outside of Tewksbury, would be the signage permit for the existing pylon that's located right here. Okay, I wasn't sure which was the line of property. and yep. I saw that little line that went along it to the right. Yeah, it's labeled I wasn't the sure that it wasn't really clear on the plan yep. if that was the property line or the other one was. Okay, um, do you have any comments about the concern with the traffic at all? Or? Yes, have you been provided a copy of the traffic study? 
I, I've seen the traffic study. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we have, again, a number of comments that came back from the planning board specifically about the traffic and the work that's being done by MassDOT. So those are part of that uh, set of conditions and decisions that we need to work through with the DOT. Um, I believe that process has been started, um, but we won't have the final answers on that until MassDOT comes out with their full plan for the, um, the work that's going on on, on Main Street. I, I, I would only point out, um, it's funny, there, there seems to be some difference. I heard the, the prior group was talking about, you know, that you have a consistent sort of uh, amount of traffic. I, I haven't found that with most of my customers. Ten, these tend to be in the evening, tend to be the busier times. So I think the, you know, from 6.30 to 8 o'clock tends to be the, the busiest time in most of these places. Um, Saturdays are obviously a little bit different, Sundays, but um, the evenings are what, you know, when people are getting out of work uh, and getting home. So I, I'm not sure, I, I, I think I'm, I'd be hopeful that, you know, the traffic is starting to die down at that time. But most of, mostly what has to happen here is people get used to the conditions and they determine times when they'll come, when they won't come. I mean, that's not uncommon in any of these places. So I think it, there there may be some period of time where people sort of try to try to get used to what the traffic pattern is here and understand it because we, we certainly understand your concern on that in that regard. Absolutely. And a final comment on that. During the site plan review meetings, it was brought up that any business that's put in this location will have similar issues. Um, access to and fro the site as it is right now. It's a busy service station. Um, their operating hours don't extend as far as, as the proposed hours do for full harvest. Um, if they close at 5 o'clock, they're hitting rush hour dropping cars off in the morning for service and rush hour picking them back up in the afternoons. So I just want to put that out there that any proposed use of this site is going to have a similar impact on the way people are navigating to and from the site. Um, and we did all of the uh, studies in terms of traffic flow and increased trips as part of that, that document that you have, I believe. If you have specific questions, we're happy to answer them. Um, Oh, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Let me turn to my right. Anyone over here? Ms. Walden. Thank you. Um, thank you for your application. Um, I appreciated that you talked about youth and public health in your presentation and also in your application. Um, and I um, can't read my note over here. So I wanted to uh, ask you two questions. Talk to me about your location and why so close to Lowell where you have another location. Um, so I guess what I would say to that, these places, that you do get uh, people from other communities coming here, okay? I mean, and you want that, obviously, to increase your sales. But by and large, because of the number uh, of these places that you have, they become the local place for the local community. Think of it as uh, like a local pharmacy, okay? You probably have... Uh, you, you might have a Walgreens here, and you have a Walgreens in the next town over, or, or, or you know, the same thing with the Dunkin' Donuts. Um, that's who really the local customers. Having having another, uh, uh, you know, dispensary in the next town over. What we're looking to do here is become the regional go-to place. Okay, all of their. Uh, other dispensaries are right in this region. Mm -hmm. We don't see it as a detriment to have other dispensaries nearby. We, we think that's a positive. We want people to know that we are the place to go in this area. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and my second question is, I looked at your pricing online for your two locations, and I noticed that there is a big difference between your Haverhill location for an eighth and for your Lowell location, which was considerably less expensive. So I was hoping you would speak to that and your pricing strategy. I think that just well, do me a favor, grab that microphone. Thank you. So uh, we brought, I brought tonight with us our wholesale buyer, Riley Ruth, our general manager, Evan Martinez, and Michelle Simpson, who does our marketing and community outreach. So the reason why they came with us is because I don't know if some of the other operators or applicants brought some of their staff that are there on a daily basis to answer some of these questions. So I guess there is a strategy um, behind it, and I don't know if maybe Riley or Evan wants to speak to that. Yeah, and if you want, just run over there to that podium and you can use that microphone. Thank you. I mean, just kind of to be completely transparent, each community has different needs and caters to different products. Um, so in Haverhill, we found out that flour does tend to sell very often. And when it comes to flour, 
it, we have to keep it at, the, at that price point in Havel. However, in Lowell, we have uh, pre-rolls who tend to sell a little bit yep. um, more often. So we can feature pre-rolls at a lower deal in bundles, mm -hmm. and that, that facilitates kind of that price point to drop in both locations. When a customer's pay, paying a little bit lower for a pre-roll in Lowell, you can't really put the eighth at a higher price point as it would be featured in Haverhill. Okay. It's just the numbers don't really align and we won't see sales in that other category. Okay, all right, that's a good explanation. I yeah. appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, I do my homework. So. They're a great team. Okay. We're very lucky to have them. <laughs> Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, Mr. Hall? I, I think I'm all set. I think most of the questions were answered as they were speaking. Okay, very good. Um, so I just have a couple in your presentation and I'm looking for you to clarify. You, um, you obviously gave um, a little bit of background about Janet um, and, and your safety officer. Um, you didn't mention Michaela Restucia, so I'm just curious. She's in the presentation, but can you speak a little bit to her involvement and background? Sure, she's, she is away, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, but she's been doing this uh, hand in hand with we, you, Janet. Yeah, Michelle and I met probably back in 2000, I guess it was 16. I came from um, a medical dispensary in Rhode Island and we met at that point and we decided to join forces. She was actually a dental hygienist and she ended up in working with Sanctuary Medicinals in mm -hmm. New Hampshire and then was involved in their cultivation site in Littleton, Mass. And, you know, she just has the love for the plant, and I have a holistic background, so we just kind of gelled right away so when we met. Still, she's a fully involved yeah. yes. partner with you? Okay. All yes. right. That's what I was curious about. Um, and then just square these numbers for me. You've indicated that um, you think you're going to, excuse me, um, bring in maybe 30 full-time people into this 1,600 square foot facility. I, I don't think that it's going to be quite 30. I think that, uh, yeah. and I was looking at the numbers, even 41, we have more than that now. We have like, yeah, like 52. we have about 52 okay. employees, right? right. So yeah, the numbers, closer. I'm like, oh, those numbers yeah, are quite a little that. bit off. That's about so 20 per location. I'm looking, I'm, I'm and, looking, yeah, I'm yeah, looking yeah. I'd, okay. I'd say we'd probably start with maybe 15, yeah. Yeah, probably around 15, right. yeah, to yeah. start with. I just want to make sure we have expectations in the yeah. right place. Yeah. Okay. All right, um, let me see here, a lot of my questions. Oh, um, on the facility, the location, and I, Council, I don't know if you can answer this, but um, it's the site of a um, automotive sales service has been for many years. So one of my concerns is ability to get up and running as fast as possible. Has there been any exploration of environmental concerns, pollution concerns? That's often common with that type of location. Yeah. Um, you know, has, is that something that you know? That's that was my on? first question yes. when I was okay. when I was shown the site, and, yeah. and I asked yeah. our, our it was one of my first questions. It was my first question. I said, "Is there any environmental issues?" And right. I was told no, but that was for the land, the, yeah. the right. right. Um, um, so the only known issue we have is with the propane tank take out back, which right. is going to be removed uh, with the direction of the fire department. Um, there is an existing oil and gas separator. That's uh, the trench drain in the garage yeah. portion of that runs into the gas oil and gas separator um, to make sure that none of that goes down the, the sewer system. Right. There are no known leaks of that. Uh, we will be doing a scope before we get okay. into any kind of demolition just to verify that. Yeah. Um, but remediation of the site would involve uh, potentially removing okay. some soils or, or yeah. something like that. Uh, as far as I know, the oil and gas separator is kind of where those front parking spots are located. Um, there's a the sedan in the middle there. Uh, it's basically about 10 feet from the trench drain location on the interior of the building. Um, so if there is any leakage of that oil and gas separator, it would be in the parking lot area, which makes it a, a lot easier to mitigate yeah. than if it were underneath the slab. Okay. And to your knowledge, I don't recall, but there, there was never a filling station there, right? There's no, no tank storage underground or anything. No, it's like not that. to our knowledge. There's Perfect. never been um, any kind of okay. underground That's storage like yeah. that on yeah. the site. Yeah, gotta be careful with that. Okay. Um, you talked about your transactions. Um, so the only other question I have is, um, you may have heard the last couple questions I asked to the prior <coughs> applicants, but. Um, are you involved with any of the other applications that are being no. presented to us? And if you don't get a license approved here, um, do you have any intention of um, partnering with any of the other applicants? No. Thank you. Okay. No. All right. 
Um, okay, I think you've covered everything that I had, um, so I appreciate your um, concise and efficient effort to get us there. I try not to bury you in paper too much. I appreciate that. <laughs> Um, all right, so I know you had a cohort walk in with you, um, and so this is a public hearing, so I, I want to make sure any residents in town or anybody mm -hmm. who's an abutter has an opportunity to speak if they have concerns. Any, sir, no, everybody's good? All right. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask my colleagues for a motion to continue this public hearing until um, July 18. So moved. Second. All right, the motion's offered by Ms. Wellman, seconded by Mr. Holland. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed to that? I will vote in the affirmative. That's a four to zero vote for our recording secretary. So, um, you know, we, we likely will have some follow-ups. Um, we'll address them, obviously, for the council. Um, and we're going to continue the process. Um, we have at least two more nights of this. Um, and then we'll be beginning our deliberation, if you will, probably when we close the hearing in July. Okay. okay. That's so, great. Thank you. Right? Yeah, Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. Best of luck and have a great night. Thank you. All right. So um, we have no other business on our agenda this evening. So I'm going to ask if um, one of my colleagues will make a motion to adjourn our meeting. Thank you, Mr. Holland. Is there a second? Second. Second. Mr. Crapman seconds. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Chair votes aye. That's four to zero. We now are adjourned. We'll see everybody tomorrow night at 6 p.m.